All right. So, convoy pulled up. And now, we're going to get to the bottom of this whole thing. Because a lot of people seem to be confused about this whole convoy thing and what it means. A lot of people seem to be confused about what this whole thing means, what the implications are. And what this has to do, why is the convoy a working class phenomenon? And we're going to begin from Twitter, all right? Going to begin from Twitter. So I made a simple tweet. <coughs> made a simple tweet. So it started here. The Canadian truckers <coughs> represent a spontaneous working class uprising at its most raw, real, and authentic level. The fact that this is even a debate or up for negotiation prove that Western Marxism has nothing in common with Marxism-Leninism. So we got some responses to this, and I'm going to highlight these responses. You understand? Our convoy has broken some brains, and it looks like some people need to learn. Yeah, this dumbass in my chat, President Zelensky of Ukraine. So Zelensky is aligned with the deep state, he's aligned with the Democrats, he's aligned with Trudeau, the Canadian Liberals, and NATO. And of course he's gonna say, Oh, they're petite bourgeois, they're not working class, because they own their own trucks, and that means they're not working class. And there's a whole lot we're gonna go through and talk about on this stream. And by the end of this stream, I'm gonna guarantee you, I'm gonna guarantee you and tell you something. By the end of the stream, in good faith, if you do not walk away agreeing with me, you're a fucking idiot by the end of this stream. Now this dude, these people, Q, whatever his name was, this dude was bothering me when I was on my Android. I was at the gym on my Android. So I didn't have time to pull up all these sources and statistics and shit. We're actually going to get to the bottom of it. We're going to get to the bottom of it here and now. And we're going to be talking, and I will make this a video. We're going to be talking about that convoy. You understand? We're getting to the bottom of it now. You understand? We got some responses to this. Shut the fuck up, President Zelensky, you fucking idiot. How about you get in my VC, because I'm going to break down every facet of every possible argument in this bitch. So actually, this is how Yara responded to me. First of all, I'm going to tell you a few things that you have to understand when it comes to this whole convoy. First thing, right off the bat, I don't want to hear about Nazi flags and Confederate flags. Those are not representative of the fucking freedom convoy. There was like one guy who went there and they took a photo op and then he was kicked out. That's what happened to the Confederate guy. I'm sure the same thing happened to the Nazi flag guy. You understand? So don't come at me and tell me about, oh, there was not, there was a Nazi flag at the convoy. That was an op. That was an op, a, an op by the British intelligence or someone else, the CIA, who fucking delegitimized the convoy movement in the eyes of the people. The media intentionally misrepresented that movement. One or two guys came with those fucking flags and nothing else. All you have to do is send a guy with a fucking Nazi flag to delegitimize an entire movement and an entire protest. Yeah, you may buy that in your mainstream media bubble where you are, in your little like bubble where you actually think that's how shit works. Zelensky, shut the fuck up because I'm gonna fucking actually blow the fuck out of every argument you're making about Oh, the owner operator and employer trucker distinction. We're actually gonna talk about that, okay? So you're gonna have to wait every possible argument you've thought of I've already destroyed five steps ahead of you. So shut the fuck up, okay? I'm specifically going one by one every single argument against communists seeing in the convoy the working class movement you understand? Yes, many of the people in the Freedom Convoy are Sikh. Many of them are Sikh. Okay, I'm going to read you something. I can't show it to you because it's a swastika. But I can read it to you. So, the photo of the swastika flag was taken in the terrace of the building. The photographer was standing on the lower part of the terrace. The people with the flags are standing on the steps. You want to know what that means? It means it was staged. It's not like someone showed up to a protest and just saw Nazi flags. It was staged to make it seem like the protesters are a bunch of Nazis. 
And if you believe that, you're a fucking idiot. I'm gonna break this down to you very simply. <clears throat> why would truck drivers be- Why would this be about being a Nazi? They're truck drivers. What does that have to do with being a Nazi? Truck drivers are protesting vaccine mandates. Why the fuck would that be grounds for the Confederate flag or the Nazi flag? I'll tell you why. Because the media is basically saying, because a lot of these people are white, and this game is- this is the game they play. They do this race bullshit using minorities against the, the, the population. They're the racists. They're used to trying to divide people based on race. Because a lot of these con convoy people happen to be white, they're trying to spook the population by saying, Oh, they're white supremacists, and they're racist, and that's why they're doing this. And it's a, it's a tactic they're doing, and I'll tell you why they're doing this tactic. Because if the poor migrant minorities in Canada unite with those convoy people, that will be the end of the Canadian ruling class. So they're trying to divide them. And it goes both ways. I know it goes both ways. But if those convoy people, those truckers, unite with those indentured servants in Canada, with those immigrants. That spells the end of the, the Canadian ruling class. So they're trying to divide people based on race, trying to divide the working class. And that's what's actually fucking going on with this shit. It's a tried and tested tactic that they've always fucking used to divide the people. They've always used this fucking tactic. So they staged the photograph of someone with a swastika, and that's what everyone's saying is defining the movement. One fucking photograph, one fucking op, they fucking did, and all of a sudden, they're all Nazis, they're all fascists. The professional managerial parasites seething with venom have hatred in their hearts for the working class and for the people. You want to know why? Because the working class and the people, they humble them. These fucking truckers are the ones delivering their fucking Amazon packages to their fucking high-rise fucking apartments. And that's what's going on here. So we're not even going to discuss this bullshit about them being Nazis or being whatever because that swastika was staged. The Confederate shit, that guy was kicked out. <laughs> he was not welcome. The working class runs this world. That's exactly right. Argument number two, and this is what these dumbasses in my chat are getting at and everyone seems to be pointing out. Oh my god, Haas. Haas. Wait a second. Aren't you a communist, Haas? You are a communist, aren't you? Well, the Canadian truckers are vocally anti-communist and they're against communism and, and they're ideologically not aligned with you. What do you think? You think they're just gonna become communists? Is that what you think? Are you deluded? I'm gonna do you a favor. I'm gonna do you a favor because I think you should Google this. So I think you should go on Wikipedia and you don't even have to read the whole thing, but just read this part. Just read this part of Wikipedia, right? And then come back to me with that shit you're saying about how ideologically they're not aligned with you, Haas. Because I think you're fucking confused about what's going on here. I think you're really confused about the relationship between ideology and class, and we're gonna actually have to break it down, right? So Google materialism and Marxism on, you just Google it, and just read Wikipedia or something, because you're so fucking ignorant of basic Marxism. You're gonna bring up to me the argument that ideologically- Ideology doesn't even fucking matter that much when we're talking about this. Why do- why should ideology matter that much? I mean, ideology does have a place, and I'll explain that place. I'll explain that place. But this is just stupid. Do you think politics is about ideas or about classes? And it's that simple. Is it a- is it about ideas or is it about classes? I know that these convoy people are not ideologically aligned with me. So we have a dumb fuck in my chat who came a little too late. I'm not repeating myself because I just fucking addressed the, their fascist argument. So we're past that point and now we're talking about the anti-communism. Okay? Now we're talking about the anti-communism part because we already debunked the thing about them being Nazis or fascists. We already debunked that stupid bullshit. King Leak, get in my fucking VC and defend that point. Because I already literally just addressed it. Okay, now, the second thing is about the anti-communism. We're gonna have to restart. We know they are ideologically anti-communist. We know they harbor many beliefs that... <laughs> I don't agree with those beliefs. Congratulations, you don't. 
They are libertarians, the exact opposite of communism. You're a fucking idiot. The world is not defined by ideology. It's not defined by ideology. It's defined by material class struggles. Certain ideologies often give form to that class struggle that are unscientific, that are not necessarily correct. That doesn't mean you define the class phenomena in terms of the ideology. I don't know why that's not intuitively self-evident to you if you're a Marxist. If you're a Marxist, you understand class struggle is the substrate around which ideology is an attempted reflection, okay? Now, ideology has a place, and I will explain that place. But first and foremost, like, when you go and talk to a working class person, this is what I want to ask these people. I don't know who this person, Yara, whoever these people are. Hypothetically, you go and talk to a working class person. Are you actually going to define the substance of what they're saying in terms of, like, discrete ideas you're gonna say oh your axioms are different from my axioms you like vosh then you're literally vosh you're not a marxist you're not a materialist you're vosh you think that the essence of things is the idea the form the form you're a formalist you believe it's the form of the idea now what a materialist does when they talk to a working class person so let's say this person is going and saying these goddamn communist liberal elites you know what a communist does it just kind of they, they just they let it go over their head and they just say okay whatever he's saying the communism thing what he's really talking about though right technically actually he's not correct in the academic sense let me put on my monocle and just did fucking scold him for not being academically correct. What a stupid fucking mentality. You have to understand that the there is a difference between the essence and the appearance of things. And that's what's fucking important. There is a difference between the essence and appearance of things. Okay? So when these people express and they're railing against communism, here are the relevant questions you have to ask. And I can't fucking believe I have to walk people through this Marxism 101. Like, I can't fuck... It's literally beyond my understanding that I have to fucking explain this, right? Here's what you do. Ask yourself the question. What do they mean by communism? What does communism mean for them? What are they referring to in material reality by communism? What is actually the essence behind the form and behind the appearance? Now, an idealist will come and say... An idealist will come and say, the essence of what they mean is the idea itself. It's the idea itself. So when an idealist looks at this anti-communist sentiment among the truckers and they go, huh, the essential reason that they are expressing anti-communist sentiment is because they are essentially anti-communists. Because they are committed to the idea of anti-communism. But a materialist says that the reason they harbor the idea of anti-communism isn't because of ideas, but because of what that refers to in material reality for them. Now, why have they come to associate communism with the liberal elite and the agenda of the ruling class and the corporations and the status quo and the mainstream media? That's a separate question, and I would be free to explain to you the reason for that. But before you even try to wrap your mind around the reason for why they're anti-communists, anti you have to first understand what they mean by anti-communism. You don't first find the reason and then go, oh, is it a valid reason or is it an invalid reason? That's not what's important. What's important is what they mean. What do they mean by anti-communism? You can take them at, at face value, which is pretty generous because you're operating under the assumption that these people are properly educated about what communism is and that they actually know what communism is. So I'll give you this example. When these truckers Holy fuck, Mom Bello. Thank you so much, brother. Appreciate you so much. Thank you so much. When these people express anti-communist sentiment, here is the question you have to ask as a materialist. Okay? Here's what you have to ask as a materialist. Are they in material reality actually really referring to communism as a historical phenomenon? So, like, for example, when they're expressing anti-communist views, is the object of their speech really the material reality of communism around the world? Well, we can actually kind of try and measure that somehow or try to actually investigate that. We can look at, for example, the character of the supporters of communism in Eastern Europe and in Russia. And we can actually look at communists in China. And when we do that, once you look past the superficial ideology, 
It's very strange how communists appear very similar to these anti-communists. In Russia, for them, communism means pretty much the same thing that anti-communism means for these truckers, which is a very curious thing. I mean, in Russia, it's the communists who are... I've... Shut... Listen. King Leak, you're either a pussy who's gonna get in my VC, or you get the fuck out of my chat. Because guess what? I destroyed Q. I'm gonna prove how I fucking destroyed him. If you think he won, it's because you're a fucking idiot. Not because he actually won, dumbass. Get in my fucking VC if you want to be unbanned. I don't have time for pussies. And if Q wants to fucking dunk on me, he has to fucking actually debate me like a man. Not hide behind his fucking keyboard. But something tells me if that dude gets in my VC, he's gonna grovel at my feet. Because he's gonna fucking be intimidated by our chat, okay? I'm drawing a line on this question, hold the water back, actually. So you don't like me if you don't- if you- you- you think I'm far off on this, okay? And why don't you explain yourself, too? I don't give a fuck if you think I'm far off on this. Explain why! On this specific point about ideology. So again, are- is the real material object of their speech really communism? Or... Does communism mean something for them that's different from the real communism? I mean, that's what you have to understand. Because they're liberal capitalists, not communists, and you are a fucking idiot. You, there's literally so many points I have to break down, and you're literally on point five right now. Shut the fuck up, because I'm on point two right now. We're going to talk about the owner-operator thing in a second, but you have to shut your fucking mouth. And wait, you're assuming I haven't thought about this, and I don't have a response to it. I do have a response to it, dumb fuck. Then why do they vote for the People's Party? Why are they ideologically this and that way? Why don't you listen? Why don't you listen to what I'm saying, dumbass? It's so fucking stupid. Ask what the essence is. What is the essential reason? The materially essential reason. Don't fucking look at the surface and just say that's it. Go deeper. Ask why. If you're a materialist, you ask why. Fucking bums in my chat can't even fucking do the minimum of criticism. You don't even have critical thinking. You think appearance and the essence is the same thing. It's not, okay? So let's first ask the question, what do they mean by communism? Clearly, what they mean by communism is very different from the actual reality of communism. And why is that? Well, first and foremost, the most obvious explanation or justification for what I'm saying is the fact that communist states don't have vaccine mandates. China was against forcing people to take the vaccines. They insisted it was voluntary. The Communist Party of the Russian Federation has come out against vaccine mandates. So communist states are not forcing people to take the vaccine. I mean, that is the most simple reason for why they're not actually referring to communism when they're expressing anti-communist sentiment. They're referring to a straw man of communism. The reasons for why they're doing that is a separate topic and i would be happy to get into it but you have to first establish they're not actually talking about communism okay now the second thing that they may be referring to by communism is the all-encompassing totalitarian whatever social control of the people right where there's no longer a social contract but the just the state absolutely dominates the individual with no back and forth and no dialectic between the people and the state and it's just the state all-encompassing state for Forcing its will on the people and not just the state but corporations and big tech all just instituting a form of total control of the people leaving them no form of sovereignty and no form of independent economic life whatsoever okay well we can actually investigate historically whether that is true for communist states now it is true that this caricature of communism was what Trotsky had planned for the Soviet Union. Just all-encompassing state property. But it was actually Stalin who insisted that the state does not own all property. That not all property is public property. And there's two forms of that. The, for the collective farms were owned by the collective, not the state. It was owned by the collective. So the state did not have all-encompassing total control. The other thing was the small garden plots that pretty much everyone was allowed to have. And there was other forms of independent control and, and ownership. Almost everyone in the Soviet Union had a DACA in the countryside that was theirs. And they had gardens there and they could sell the produce in a way, right? And the same is true for China. So this association of the historical experience of communism with just all-encompassing state ownership of everything doesn't reflect the reality. 
in, to in today's China, communism is economically associated with the people having some form of compound security, independent security. Whether that takes the form of a small plot of land or the ownership of single unit apartments that they own, right? And also China, you obviously can own a business on top of that and you can own, you can have your own businesses and, and whatever. So this is a, when you actually study the historical experience of communism, you will find that the, hold on, that the historical experience of communism you will discover that the historical experience of communism radically contrasts with the idea of communism that these people have in their head. So if that's true and that these people are genuinely confused and have misunderstood what communism actually was in history and what it represented in its respective countries, the question you then have to ask is whether, if actually shown or adequately persuaded about what communism was, they would be sympathetic to communism. If they knew, for example, what Mao represented for the Chinese people, the peasants, the Chinese peasants against the liberal elites and the urban elites, and the same for Stalin with the Russian peasant against the urban elites of the Soviet Union. I mean, they would probably be more sympathetic to Stalin and Mao if they actually had a good idea of what happened there. The problem with why they don't is that first of all the cold war and nato and um ruling class created education system in canada and america has brainwashed its decades and decades of brainwash about communism so and the other thing too is that china and russia are on the other side of the fucking world so they just don't have any idea of their history and their specific experience so we have to be just keep in mind what they mean by communism. What they mean by communism is a straw man of communism, a propaganda version of communism that was created by the ruling class. And it's almost as if once you are you guys following me? Is this, is this too like theoretically heavy? Because I feel like this is so fucking simple, right? I feel like it's always it's just so fucking simple, right? OK, now then what you have to do is ask the question. It's uh, uh, proposed. It's almost as if what Canadian truckers are actually saying is correct. What they're actually saying when you get to the essence of the matter is they're saying this. All of the things you taught me about communism, you're doing now. You taught me to, that communism was this bad thing because um, it's, it's social control and it's forcing people and it's taking away our rights and our liberties and our dignity and our human dignity and all that kind of stuff. And it's this tyranny. Well, you're doing that now. So that's the essence of their anti-communism they are literally telling the liberal elites that this new form of capitalism is indistinguishable from all the shit they would say about communist states and actually many marxists have pointed that out, that out in, in in different words they've said well it's funny how all the things they warned us about in communism are happening under capitalism people don't own homes anymore people don't have any control over their lives anymore they have nothing they're under the total subordination and control of corporations and and we were being brainwashed and like 1984 wasn't what happened in the soviet union it's what's happening now right so at its essence beyond the surface their anti-communism is correct when you actually look at what they're trying to refer to they're right they're just not using the right word instead of calling it communism but but okay then then this the the third thing you have to ask <coughs> is okay i'm an educated communist and i can clearly see that they're using the wrong word they should not be calling it communism or denouncing communism so how do we approach that first and foremost we have to patiently make it clear one before anything what practical utility a real communism would have for them? I mean, you don't don't just go and say you're wrong. Actually, you're wrong because that doesn't matter. Actually, give them a reason to be sympathetic to communism. Give them a reason to change their views on communism by giving a new meaning to communism. So tell them and show them that communism in Canada means the convoy. Communism in Canada means the working class banding together and fighting the ruling class. Communism means abandoning the illusions that some of the self-proclaimed leaders of the convoy who are duping people are throwing on them. Communism means always support the working class. Yes, Pepe. 
Communism means, yes, we're against the vaccine mandates. The Russian communists are against it. So why shouldn't we give sh tell them that? The Russian communists are against the vaccine mandates. So are we. Communism is better than the eclectic ideologies they're adopting now. <coughs> because communism will allow us to scientifically understand the forces behind all of these changes and what it means for us and what the key and the weapon see this is the tragic truth the freedom convoy is doomed i'm not gonna lie to you and tell you it's not it's doomed just like every other peasant uprising in history was doomed it is doomed right but where communists come in and step in is that they say listen we have the keys to overthrow this working class this ruling class that you hate this great reset agenda this tyranny of the liberal elites we have the keys to overthrow them and we should prove that to them we should prove that to them it's our duty to prove it to them that's the first thing you do and then on top of that you also patiently educate them education is important patiently talk to them educate them on how they got it wrong and how we've been lied to about communism in russia and china and we've been lied to about communist history and that in fact communist history will show that we're aligned with them and give them the meat and potatoes. Communism doesn't mean, thank you, Chris Morlock. Thank you, Chris Morlock. Communism doesn't mean we're going to take your shit away and, and, and control you. And you're not going to be able to have your own trucks or your own businesses or your own livelihood. It, we're not going to aggregate you and, and force you to be in a whatever. It doesn't mean we're going to make everyone equal and, and do all this shit. Patiently explain to them what communism actually does mean. And what communism actually does mean is land reform. We're going to break monopolies and give you land to start off on and that's what our common social goal is that the people right should have means of production that's the goal of communism forgive debt that's another thing that's and that's what i'm going to get into which i didn't on twitter but that's what we're going to get into tonight is the debt question which no one's paying attention to when it comes to these canadian truckers okay so you can see if you have a problem with false ideological consciousness among the working class, you don't use that as an excuse to denounce the working class, the material substrate. What you do is prove the worth of these ideas. Prove it to them that, that they should think of communism differently. That's your duty. That's your responsibility. So this person did not make an argument, actually. She did not make an argument. All she did was point out... Um, Potentially that they, they have ideological views she disagrees with. But she did not make an argument as to the question of whether they are working class or not, right? Whether this is the rank and file and the base of a potential communist movement. And despite what she's trying to say about actual communists, there are no actual communists in Canada. Just like there are no actual communists in America. We don't have a communist movement. Communism basically means nothing in both of these countries. In both Canada and America, communism is either a straw man of the right or <clears throat> it's a form of liberal edginess to the extreme, which is also based on the straw man that right-wingers have created. So there's no real meaning to communism in America and Canada. We have to import the meaning. We have to give sense to it in an authentic way, okay? But... So this second prong, so the first prong that they're Nazis, Confederate flag, that's debunked. The second prong, ideologically, they're not communist or they're anti-communist. Again, that's just idealism that has nothing to do with the mater a materialist view. And some idiot was like, okay, Haas, so are you saying that these people are just going to spontaneously become communists? No, I'm not saying that because that's where communists are supposed to come in. <laughs> That's where you're supposed to actually try and lead the movement and prove your worth in, in giving them the, these ideas. But it's like, it's so simple. That's literally what class consciousness is supposed to be about. It, 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 all of this is in literature from 150 years ago. Marx and Engels talked about it. The Social Democrats talked about it. Lenin talked about it. Stalin and Mao, they, 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 it's very simple. Communists are the ones who are supposed to give form to the content. The content is not going to spontaneously become communist. Scientific socialism is not ever going to arise spontaneously you need an organ a spirit a head that independently formulates this it's not just gonna come from the ground what's gonna come spontaneously is chaos and yes other forms of socialism take a very eclectic and yes oftentimes problematic form i mean 
Karl Kotsky called anti-Semitism the socialism of fools. Why? Because spontaneously, anti-Semitism would become popular among the working class. Um, of course, uh, other forms of reactionary socialism become popular. Conspiracy theories are very big, uh, although some of them are actually correct, right? But yes, some believe in reptilian alien shapeshifters. Some believe in um, that communists control us, which actually has some grounding in reality, to be honest. Um, some of them believe in the Illuminati. Again, these are all things that actually do have a grain of truth, to be honest. But they have all sorts of beliefs. Some of them are free market Austrians, right? I mean, some of them, I don't know, they like Jordan Peterson or they, they watch Steven Crowder. I, I don't know. I mean, there's a there's just chaos. It's what it is, is chaos. And communists are not supposed to denounce chaos, but represent the logos that arises out of the chaos. As Dugan would put it, communists represent the logos that emerges from the chaos. That is what scientific socialism is. It's not just going to be born uh, spontaneously. It's going to be delivered by the wet nurse, the chora, the substrate, right? The ground, the imp impenetrable depth of chaos, the chora in platonic language. The wet nurse will deliver the chora, sorry, deliver the logos with our assistance. Communism is very simple, yes. It's all very simple, what I'm saying. Do you follow me? Because I don't know why this should ever be controversial. I don't know why there's a dispute about it, or a debate, or a controversy. I don't know why anyone would ever, like, contest. What about this is hard to comprehend? <clears throat> I mean, how can you not wrap your head around this? Before we move to the debate about the class nature of the truck drivers, is there anyone who can contest what I just said? You cannot judge a phenomena based on ideology on the surface. You have to go to the essence of things. Is there anyone who would ever argue against that before we move on? Because I feel like this is like a set in, I feel like this is like set. There's no way, there's nothing you can say. What could you say? What could you say? Oh no, ideology is what matters. Okay, then you're an idealist. You're not a Marxist. The only thing you could possibly say is what Q tried to say, which was that it was not a working class movement. And that's what he was trying to argue. That's what, that's what he was trying to argue. And he's wrong. But what he said requires more theoretical explanation to respond to. Okay? You, so there's no debate. There's absolutely nothing anyone could say so far. One, no one can argue they're Nazis. No one can argue that, that the swastika was representative or the Confederate flag was representative. Two, Nobody could say that the superficial anti-communist sentiment that's being expressed among the truckers indicates a radical incompatibility between communists and the truckers in terms of persuading them, right? So the final argument, which itself is going to have many prongs to it, is going to be the question, well, are these working class protesters at all in the first place? That is where the guy Q comes in. So first, you, you see my response, basically what I just said. Someone who confuses ideologies with material reality, and so on. So Q had to step in, because there's no defending her argument, so he had to bring a new one, which was this. So this is where we find the confusion. And here is where you're going to have to bear with me. And here is also where I'm going to be introducing um, things that are not universally accepted by Marxists. <coughs> just because it's a, it's a, it's a new analysis, right? which you probably never heard before. So this is where you're going to have to bear with me. All right, so this is what he says. The working class is defined by sale of one's labor in exchange for money. So what would the rest of us look like aligning with the owners present at the protest while truckers themselves are for the most part not participating or even blocked from re-entering Canada by the convoy? So we are met with a, a thing, right? So there's many things we have to address here. There's like a ton, right? The first thing um, concerns the the property owning status of the, 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 the truck driver. So there's a word called owner operator in Canada. It's called o owner operator, right? And owner operator, there's a distinction. So some truck drivers are just <coughs> employees and they're hired by a company to drive trucks, but they don't own any of the trucks, right? The second thing 
is an owner operator who yes are more disproportionately represented at these protests there's no i have no doubt about that who basically own their own trucks and get hired for freelance by others to deliver goods with their own trucks and among a minority of those owner operators there are people who have been successful enough and wealthy enough um to buy more trucks and hire people and shit and that's how some trucking businesses have arisen and it's very similar to to peasants right some peasants own land and just own the land some are serfs who don't own any land <clears throat> Some are proletarians who are hired to work on land. And some are successful enough to buy more land, hire more peasants, and effectively become landlords, right? So there's a few myths we have to debunk. First of all, among the so-called owner-operators, <clears throat> some owner-operators are in worse conditions than company truckers. I'm going to, yeah, I'm getting into that. Very few are successful, most are immigrants. Yes, I'm getting into it, okay? Um... There's a confusion around this, which Q, in his dishonesty, is not going to be telling you about. Which is that, for many, a huge proportion, I don't have the exact statistics on me. Well, if someone has the statistics, um, link them to me. For many of the so-called owner-operators, they actually do have employers who force them to file under the... Um, let me see what I was sent, so I can just give you the specific uh, thing. <coughs> so yeah, the truckers are are um, yes, the the trucking companies don't want to hire them as W two employees. So and and give them benefits, so they set up LLCs, and like ninety nine percent of the truckers that own the business only own it because the company tells them to or forces them to so they file their llc's as independent uh, business owners so that the companies that they work for don't have to give them benefits and don't have to give them adequate compensation okay but that's just the first point so the majority of these so-called owner operators are employees who are forced to list as llc's because employers don't want to give them benefits and also abide by labor regulations and shit like that. So that's very important to keep in mind. Okay? <clears throat> the second thing, which is where it's going to get a little more theoretically heavy. Well, no. Another thing. People are saying, well, why don't you see a similar proportion of company drivers joining in on the protests? It's actually very simple. Company drivers have no leverage. They're more desperate. They have, they, they have less independence. They can't afford to do things like this. Every rebellion in history was started not by the people who have the most to lose, but by people who do have something to lose and therefore have the leverage to be able to revolt. That's just true for every rebellion in the history of humanity. Um... And that's how they start. And those people open the gates for the lesser privileged to join in. So yeah, of course, um, operator owners are going to have more leverage. And they're going to be the, at the front lines of this. Because they can't be fired. Yeah, company drivers can get fired. Some of them might not even be citizens, right? So there's that. Now there's people telling me, Oh, Haas, then why are all these people white? Why are they only exclusively white? Okay, that's your claim. That's what the media has told you. That's what you're hearing. And the question stands as to whether that reflects the facts. So looking at the facts, um, we find people like this. Send this message. So let's raise the volume. Mr. Justin Trudeau, please yeah. tell him that we're united. It's just not a white supremacist group. We're not a small fringe minority. Thank you. We're not. Thank you. I don't see any Nazi flags. I mean, you'd think if this was a Nazi movement, there'd at least be one. I don't see any of those, okay? So they're trying to tell you it's a white supremacist movement, 
And that's clearly not the case. There are people from other backgrounds in the movement too. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's just not correct, right? Um, so that argument's blown out of the fucking water. Okay, finally, about this thing about the working class and selling its labor. This is, this is the third thing we're going to have to get into, which is going to be a little more difficult to comprehend and, and follow with me. But you have to bear with me. Just follow me here, okay? Because I have a lot of history to unpack, actually. So this is an example of someone who doesn't comprehend dialectics. He basically thinks that concepts like the working class are static and based on definitions um, that exist forever. And not once do you see in any of this Q guy's tweets any attempt to, again, get to the essence of things. Why has the working class been defined as it? What is the deeper reason for the working class being associated with the sale of one's labor? Is the essence of the working class the definition of the sale of one's labor? Or is there a deeper reason for the historical association between the two? Um, and that's what I'm going to set about to explain now. Okay. Thank you, Chris Morlock. And... Please bear with me here, right? So historically, I'm going to give you a picture of the emergence of capitalism in the 19th century. Bear with me, please. On the one hand, you had the emergence of a rather ineffective liberal laissez-faire state. This is the example of England. So in this liberal state, here is where you have interpolated, and all across Europe also, by the way, the basis of capitalism, actually. So in capitalism, you have people who sell commodities and people who sell the basis of commodities itself, which is labor. But this reduction of um, and this tendency for society to um, join into either two camps, right? You'd owners and selling their labor, right? This is actually something that takes as its basis the universalism of the state, the universal liberal state. So in older forms of statehood, you had various castes and classes that were recognized by the state. But in a universal state, everyone is an equal citizen. So, when, But when everyone's an equal citizen, you still have class. Why? Because some people are going to be selling things. I mean, technically, if everyone's an equal citizen, we are all capitalists. In a, in a liberal state, technically, we're all capitalists, right? We're all people who have the right to have property and we can sell things and, and trade things and buy things. And we're not anchored down by the old feudal obligations and, and um, structures, right? We're just dwelling in cities and we can just do whatever we want. We can sell what we want. We're free, sovereign men, right? Except, and this is where materialism comes in and becomes relevant, things... The things that we're selling and buying, for example, those have a basis, and that basis is human labor. So a great many people are going to find themselves in the awkward situation of selling their labor. I mean, how will things be made in a society without someone making them? You could have a situation where there's a city, and everyone's kind of a capitalist, and you just have slaves make everything, and, and we just trade the commodities that slaves make. Maybe that's like ancient Athens or, I don't know, something like that, right? Or, or Rome at some point. Probably not, right? Because Rome had a working class of its own. But you get the point. Like, how does private property even manifest? And how do we get the things that are being traded and exchanged? So in a bourgeois liberal state, you end up with an awkward scenario where if we're not going to be slaves and we are all going to be equal citizens... Right, And this equality is most acute in the cities, the formal equality, I mean, where you're not going to be weighed down by the differentiations in landed propriet pro property. Um, there's going to be labor itself will become a commodity. If I'm not a slave or a serf or even a peasant and I'm a free citizen who's equal with all other citizens, I'm going to end up selling my labor as a commodity. But the paradox is that labor is the source of all commodities itself. So I'm selling the source of commodities in the first place, right? So it's a Mobius strip. It's, it's out of this paradox that arises class difference. The bourgeoisie own things. The proletariat only owns their labor. Now, how did that come to pass? Why can't the proletariat own some things? No, and I'll tell you why. Because the process of creating this universal state in which we are all equal corresponded to flattening and uprooting the traditional forms of ways of life in the countryside. So peasants were uprooted from their land because they had previously been tied to their land. See, peasants were not universal equal citizens so to speak, because 
they were embedded in these traditional rural relations that you know did not entail a complete full equality at all they were in they were like in the soil working and attached to land and so on and so on so when this order was disrupted and they were uprooted whether that's through indebtedness and that's something i'm actually going to get into here they found themselves at the with the short end of the stick they they had nothing they had absolutely fucking nothing so they migrated to the cities to sell their labor which is the only thing they had they were their land was taken away and all they had was their labor to sell right um and this is the basis of liberal bourgeois equality so it's a scam right Oh, we're all equal, but before we can be equal, we're going to take away your human substance and you're going to have nothing to sell but your labor. And that's the, the liberal bourgeois quality of capitalism right it's a scam some people already you know can sell shit and, 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 and own property and they're going to be buying our labor right now does it end there no in 19th century europe this capitalism this specific sociological arrangement was actually confined always to a minority of the population when you moved over to the countryside it turns out not everyone was already proletarianized and not all of the landlords had become capitalists so and and these rural um relations were actually impediments to the development of the forces of production so the Productive forces were developing in the cities and industry was rising and in the countryside, um, you had stagnation and decay and, 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 and an anchoring that was just this impediment to the development of capital and the forces of production, right? So that is why there is such an acute difference between the working class and the peasants because the peasants, I mean, what is a peasant, right? A peasant, when people say, Haas, how can you call the truckers peasants? Well, technically I can't because yes, it is true that peasants are people who work in agriculture. They're agricultural peasants peasants that's what a peasant means and the reason peasants are agricultural is because they are embedded in these old traditional relations that have not been subsumed by capital by the capitalist mode of production yet right so in europe you did have this acute difference between feudalism and the ancient regime and capitalism which was this rapid development of the forces of production and modern whatever we call modernization okay now bear that in mind Okay, it's like I have to explain history to these people because what this person says, it it doesn't make sense for understanding class today. I mean, what, everyone who owns something is not the working class? So a, an electrician who owns his toolbox is not the working class? Uber drivers are not the working class? I mean, these are just things we know intuitively are wrong. So we just have to make sense with, we have to make sense of like, what the problem is, right? Because there clearly is a problem. It, it can't be that this guy's right and that, you know, the working class only have their labor to sell. It's just not true. I mean, the working people own homes, people own cars, they own plenty of means of production today. So why is that? How did that come to be? And that's what I'm going to be here to set about to, to explain to you. Okay. Now it turns out it just so happens to be what is the basis of this universalization of the state, because it kind of sounded like I said that the state created the bourgeoisie and the and the pe and the proletariat. No, it's actually not true. The bourgeoisie that created the universal liberal state in the first place arose from the peasants. Now, historically, there's all sorts of um, examples, right? So there's serfs who escaped and moved to cities and, and became capitalists. But the main way in which it happened, like if we're looking at the English Civil War and all that kind of stuff, is that there were peasants in the countryside, small holding peasants, who, had, <clears throat> who were successful and they had surpluses of agricultural production. And these surpluses of agricultural production, they would use to invest like as a form of capital. And before you knew it, they no longer had to work on land. They could hire people. And, and it's from this basis that you see the emergence of the capitalist class, right? What does Lenin say about the origins of capitalism? Lenin, <clears throat> to paraphrase him, <clears throat> he would say capitalism is being reproduced every minute, every hour, every minute, every second at the lowest levels of the peasantry are you guys aware of that quote from lenin and this was after the establishment of the soviet union he said the capitalist mode of production is being reproduced every day every hour every minute every second at the lowest level of the peasantry why did lenin say that because the basis of capitalism and modernity is always being reproduced there's something i want to introduce you guys to and they're called k-waves they're called contradeus 
I forget how to pronounce them, cycles. Capitalist crisis is not one thing that happens that just leads to socialism. Capitalism and its development correspond to constant revolutions in the forces of production, constant sociological revolutions of the emergence of new capitalist classes and new proletarianizations, all corresponding to revolutions in the mode of production. These are K-waves that you can see it throughout history. Capitalist crisis resolves itself because of these revolutions in the forces of production, which offset the falling rate of profit. This is why capitalism has survived for as long as it has. I mean, Marxists have never been able to explain that. I just explained it to you. I don't want to have a detour, but this is related. Interestingly enough, the paradox of capitalism's endurance is that across all of these K-waves and revolutions in the forces of production that are the lifeline of capitalism, we witness an increasing level of socialization and an increasing level <clears throat> of the decline of profit as the actual anchoring point of the economy. It's almost like capitalism, through its development, is slowly turning into socialism. And with the emergence of China today, and China is a socialist country with a socialist mode of production, it's almost like we are entering a socialist mode of production, or even already have. And that's what all the hubbub is about when it comes to the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> the, fall, the, the profit rate, don't get it confused. The pro... <coughs> Fuck! The profit rate across history in the long term has actually declined. But the machine of capitalism is propelled because of the state, because of debt, and because of increasingly non-capitalist forms of production. Companies operating at a loss that are in debt, etc., etc., etc. That's something to keep in mind because this is a very important piece of the puzzle we're going to be talking about. If capitalism is constantly being reproduced <clears throat> from its opposite, which is supposedly feudalism and its relics like the peasantry, as Lenin said, that means capitalism never conquered feudalism. Marx in Capital Volume 3 was confronted with the, the enigma, the paradox of landed property and how its endurance is proving to be um, a kind of obstacle for the development of the forces of production and for capital, right? The form of capitalist property. Capital and landed property are possess a contradictory relationship toward, toward one another, okay? So you have this distinction, right? Now, let's fast forward a little bit. During the capitalist crisis of 1929, um, you saw a breakdown of capitalism as a whole, right? I mean, other things <clears throat> were going on, namely... Um, as a predecessor, actually, I should talk about that. I shouldn't fast forward too fast. Something interesting was going on in the countryside. The way in which the countryside was becoming subordinated to the capitalist mode of production was principally through the mechanism of debt. So peasant proprietors were becoming separated from their means of production through debt, through indebtedness. <clears throat> they were being forced to buy their land <clears throat> from landowners and, and landlords. The land that they had historically worked on. And they were working their land to pay off debts. Now, what happens with debt? It's always what happens with debt. Um, you end up not being able to pay off your debt through your property. So what do you do? You sell your property. So peasants were just starting to sell their land en masse and migrate to the cities because they were in debt to creditors who were parasitically sucking their, you know, sucking their life essence from them, right? Sucking them dry. Now, keep that in mind. Debt as a driving force for transforming uh, the relations of production of feudalism and the ancient regime. Meanwhile, capitalists, well, not specifically only capitalists, but banks, right? I mean, financial capitalists, monopolists, but specifically financial capitalists were starting to buy up land because of this. They were starting to come into... Um, possession of vast, vast swaths of land. And land actually became a way of, um, a form of security for, um, issuing loans. That was the case in Italy, where the actual landlords were absentee landlords, but they would use their land as a form of leverage, as a form of security, in order to, like, give loans, and they'd become the basis for banking, right? In any case, these static feudal mode of production was starting to be put to work 
in service of the development of the forces of production, specifically though in the service of capital. You had a very paradoxical thing, and Lenin would talk about it in Imperialism, Marx was talking about it in Capital Volume 3, where it's not just that the capitalist mode of production and, and the pursuit of profit became dominant. Debt and banks specifically would acquire a new role of almost replacing the feudal landlords and the feudal um, aristocracy, in a sense, of representing the conditions of the reproduction of capital itself. In order to make, in order to be a capitalist, for example, I have to take certain premises for granted. The first one is actually land, ground rent. So as a capitalist, I don't just, I don't actually own all my means of production. I have to pay rent, ground rent to um, landowners and private landholders um, in order to, uh, in order to, uh, in order for my means of production to, to work to have means of production, right? My factory is on top of land I do not own. That's a capitalist, okay? So phenomena like Georgism in Marxist time would emerge, which actually wanted to have the state own all land, specifically to eliminate the parasitical role of the, feu the feudal landlord and the capitalist, and that the issue of ground rent was the entire, Marx called it the, the final panacea of the bourgeoisie with which to resolve all social contradictions. They were blaming the landlord, right? Which had a grain of truth to it, right? Um, in any case, through imperialism and increased financialization, um, land starts to turn into real estate right and specifically becomes a financial asset it no longer becomes like a static form of property just owned by a feudal lord it becomes a liquid financial asset that is now integrated into the capitalist mode of production but and this is a very important thing you have to keep in mind this fundamental material basis of the universality out of which arises capitalist relations was constantly reproducing itself and, and it never was something you could just take for granted whether under the feudal landlord or the financial monopolist the banker the monopolist uh the financial capitalist the rentier parasite eternity something that's static like land for real estate right it's static things that are not part of the linear motion that are not a function of time for capitalism but are a function of space endure so capitalism is marked by temporal relations which have to do with capital invest make money profit that's time right and labor respectively i sell my labor i get a wage wage is measured how through time so there's a temporal aspect of capitalism but also the spatial aspect which used to be um dominated by feudal relations just reproduces itself in a new way so many marks just have this misunderstanding that in capitalism time just replaces space no the eternal spatial relations just take on a new form so it is in this way that the ancient regime and feudalism reproduces itself in a new way a new type of peasantry arises a new type of landowner arises a new type of landlord new type of aristocracy new type of the static fixed relations of production that we associate with feudalism re-emerges in a new way and this is perfectly dialectical. The future never becomes fully reconciled by the past <clears throat> as much as the future accelerates. I mean, this is what, this is my argument against the Landian accelerationists. This is what I told them, or not told them, but this is how I responded to them. I said, you are accelerationists. You don't understand that for as much as there is an acceleration, there is a deepening of the past. There's a deepening of eternity. And that's where Dugan comes in. Dugan is the past, eternal past. Nick Land and the accelerationists are the eternal future. Infrared, my understanding of Marxism in the 21st century is reconciling both of them as part of the same thing, right? For as, and this is what Dugan, he calls it archaeo modernity. The more we accelerate into the future, the more the wealth and depth of the past reveals itself. There's things about the past we didn't know. The past has things in it we haven't conquered, right? So the more capitalist modernity triumphs, the more the depth of feudalism and everything we associate with pre-modernity reveals itself in a new and deeper way. And I don't really have a lot of time to talk about this, but this is what corresponds to um, the uneven combined and uneven development of capitalism, not even in Europe, but elsewhere. Like, for example, foreign modes of production, the, the Russians, right? Russian empire was backward, right? The more capitalism triumphed in Europe, the more it was confronted with backward Russia, the more modernity triumphed in Russia and Europe, it was confronted with backward China. Now it's the backward Islamic world. 
And it, it keeps going into the past, basically. It keeps going. The past is never fully conquered. It just, capitalism increasingly exists alongside increasingly antiquated forms of modes of production, all existing simultaneously, right? Would Socialist China tolerate these truckers? These truckers would have no reason to exist in Socialist China. Continuing uh, off of what I was saying, something specifically happened after the crash of 1929. By this point, most people were proletarianized, but you also did have a sizable peasant class. But you had a, a, a widespread crisis, fa crisis facing entire countries and nations. Widespread unemployment, widespread immiseration, widespread pauperism. So what happened? <clears throat> a new social contract was formed between the state, the imperialist state, I should add, and the people and the working class. The state was not only going to adjust itself to the increased level of socialization, it was going to initiate this form of socialization specifically by adopting policies that were social in nature. The state was no longer the laissez-faire liberal state, which had a hands-off approach, but a state that was now concerned with how are people going to make their livelihood, how are people going to have their bread, right? So the state increasingly led a attempt to revive the economies through kind of socialistic measures um taking on economic policies it's going to give people loans for houses and land and it's going to establish jobs programs and suddenly the ability for people to have a livelihood is something that's going to be considered um relevant to politics and to the state and and through the state corporations and all of their regulations and so on and so on now the specific form that took was specifically um, giving, and now this security of the state of giving, ensuring people have the minimal of livelihood, which is actually now a political concern, actually does take the form of discrete forms of property. These precise policies were what allowed people to own homes and own cars and own a lot of other things. But the form of ownership is not capitalist in the traditional liberal sense, because these are forms of ownership given and guaranteed not only by the state, but the state and the corporations and the facilitation of capital through industrial modernity itself. Now, whereas the liberal form of ownership is just this static, I own it and I can do whatever I want with it. These forms of ownership were facilitated. Cars are the best example because they're mobile. We don't just own cars like we own land. We own cars because they facilitate production. So these are facilitative, compound forms of labor given to the working class, which represent its form of security of an increasingly socialized state. The distinction is very crucial. It's a compound form of property not a static form of property which means it's a it's compounds the labor of the working class into a functional form of property this is not a form of property that's just being sold by a money-grubbing capitalist in an impartial distance way what it is please bear with me guys is a mecca suit the car the home the toolbox that the electrician owns whatever these are mecca suits of the working class the working class owns a mecca uh, an exoskeleton suit with which it uses as a compound to compound its own labor it uses the mecca suit as the new substrate from which it sells its labor only atop this substrate that sells its labor in today's economy you can't sell your labor without a mecca suit so you need that mecca suit right and that mecca suit facilitates and reproduces the very conditions of the universal sale of labor we only have the traditional capitalist arrangement of you a capitalist who owns commodities and me a laborer who only has their labor to sell on top of a substrate that reproduces the very conditions of the universal state and what these mecca suits do is precisely that and how do they do it one by ensuring a minimum of social order the population is satisfied enough to not you know um, be unemployed and, and desperate and starving and, and completely immiserated and by the way capitalism and and markets won't even function if that's the, if everyone's just poor as shit there's going to be no development of the forces of production and it's a function of politics your country's going to be weaker to other countries and geopolitically it's going to be a problem so there's that um there's also the fact that 
It's, an, it's necessary to reproduce the very conditions of labor because the technological forces of production have accelerated to such an extent that labor requires more, not only more skill, but more property. Like, can you really be a laborer in today's economy without a smartphone? Of course you can't, right? So these are necessary to facilitate production in the first place. Now, only when you take all of these things for granted can I just sell my labor? That is where labor, the extraction of labor value, I should say, is going to begin. Only atop that substrate. So it's almost as if, and I want to paint a picture for you in your head, land, agricultural land specifically, was converted into this highway of gears facilitating the movement of capital and the capitalist mode of production and the development of the forces of production. And instead of owning static pieces of land, you begin to own parts of the, the gears in this machine. But the difference is that these are gears in a machine that are facilitative and which are moving. And that facilitativeness also reflects in the fact that these are not unconditional forms of property with which you just do whatever you want. They're subject to government regulations. The government regulates how and in what way you can use them. So all of this comes together. Now, the reason why you were able to have these federal regulations of property, though, was because there was a deal. People were given property in the first place with which to make a living through a host of pol combined policies, of course. And then the government's going to regulate how and where they can be used because... It helps us overall. It's good that we have traffic laws. I mean, it's good that, you know, we can't just drive our cars in whatever fucking way we want to. That helps us drive on the road, right? So the working class as a whole is defined by having a compound form of property. But it is not property in the liberal capitalist sense. Because A, it's a facilitative form of property that facilitates the mode of production and the forces of production. B, it's not a form of property with which they can distance themselves from and abstract themselves from because it's their mecha suit which compounds their labor. So what is the definition of a compound form of property, ladies and gentlemen? It is a form of property that compounds one's labor. That's what compound form of property means. I just made up that phrase, by the way. It's a mecha suit, right? And you need the mecha suit to be a laborer, okay? So now we're getting to these operator owners, right? It's almost as if after the New Deal and after these reforms and these changes in the forces of production that happened, the proletariat fused with the peasantry. Now, on the one hand, it was still the proletariat that was selling its labor. But on the other hand, like the peasantry, it possessed some form of security uh, in the form of a kind of property that guaranteed it a minimum of subsistence, right? And not only that, but it represented the material reproduction of the polity. Now, when I discovered this, actually, I was confronted with the paradox of the working class. So I studied this and I kept going into the past and I realized this is actually true even for liberal capitalism. There was never a pro pure proletariat in history before the compound form of labor was the plot of land. So the only thing that changed was a revolution in the forces of production that de-essentialized agriculture. And then I discovered that it wasn't just during the 1930s that the state embarked on this kind of proverbial land reform where it gave the population some kind of security. I came to learn that every single revolution in the history of humanity seemed to have been about land or some equivalent equivalent to it and that every state to secure a basis in the population and to secure the loyalty of the population principally did this in the form of allotting and redistributing land and that actually this was the basis for feudalism because in feudalism how did lords and nobles and knights emerge because kings were giving people land i mean this was true this is true for every moment in, in human history it's one of the only things that are universal across all history the entirety of civilization i don't care where you go go to the incas go to the aztecs go to the egyptians i mean go to go to greece go to ancient rome it was all about this dialectic of the state and its material foundation in the people specifically in the form of this security this minimum of a security or some kind of means of subsistence so this is where dugan enters here and it's like it's something eternal this is where like something that is fundamentally eternal enters and the class struggle described by Marx between the proletariat and, and, and the bourgeoisie is just a footnote in this more ancient and eternal phenomena of um, the significance of land for the polity, right? Capitalist modernity only differs from ancient times 
Because here we are dealing with a mode of production of the constant revolutionizing of the forces of production. The difference between capitalism and these ancient societies is that capitalism is a mode of production constantly in motion, right? It's constantly about developing forces of production, new technologies, building new things. Um, increase. These are all the things Marx described. All that is solid melts into air. But this more fundamental um, structure of human societies and polities survived that. So the peasants got replaced... So in the same way, listen, let me tell you, the difference between capitalism and feudalism is the same thing as the difference between a plot of land and a truck. A plot of land is static and does not entail any facilitative development of the forces of production. A truck, meanwhile, it's like perfect poetry. A truck has fucking wheels. It has fucking wheels. Not only does it have wheels, it entails a certain level of socialization because it can only drive on highways, highways that are created in common, oftentimes by the state and by the government, right? So it's like this beautiful poetic analogy. But the mistake Marxists made was that they assumed that this more fundamental material antecedents out of which capitalism emerges is eliminated with feudalism and that's not true even after you get rid of feudalism our more fundamental human antecedents and human eternity right somehow survives that and actually it was lenin who had first discovered this lenin had first discovered this in the form of recognizing the significance of the democratic petty bourgeoisie or the peasants lenin told the, Men the mensheviks were, were linear temporalists so they, they had this stupid view that, oh, feudalism is disappearing, so we should align with the progressive liberal bourgeoisie in the cities who are newer, and that's the ally of the proletariat. Lenin said no. Lenin had a more dialectical view of history. For Lenin, history doesn't move as a linear thing. It's a zigzag. It, it goes here, and it goes back, and it goes forward, and it goes back in zigzags, right? So the way Lenin was thinking was that he said, no, this bourgeoisie in the cities looks like it's brand new, but for that precise reason, the owl of Minerva has taken flight. It's too late. Look to the basis, the essential basis of that class. Look to where they had emerged from afresh, the living basis of this class class and that is in the countryside it is the countryside that gave birth to this city bourgeoisie when he told the mensheviks he said that city bourgeoisie you're looking at they already got rich right they're they're done they already are dependent on the czar and they they're dependent on the the, the landowners and they made it already if you want to go to the essence of what makes this class progressive and revolutionary go to their actual material essential basis which was from the countryside Look at the aspiring bourgeoisie in the countryside. Look to the Chora, out of which was born the appearance. That was Lenin's materialist brilliance, right? And even after the victory of the, 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 um, the revolution, Lenin said, the basis of capitalism is always being reproduced every minute, every second, every day, every hour at the lowest levels of the peasant. Lenin recognized that modernity's attempt to conquer its premises was a foolhardy task. Dialectics means we be reconciled with our premises. Not just the phallic masculine logos, but also the Sophia. We came from a mother. We came from the Sophia. The ruling class fantasy has always been to replace the Sophia with logos. And this is a foolhardy task. You can't replace your mother. Doesn't matter how much you hate her. She's there. That's where you came from. That's where everyone comes from as a mother. You can't replace that. There's no way to conquer that or replace that. You have to make peace with it. That this is a fundamental part of our humanity. So if a misogynist can do that with his hatred of woman, women, we must do that with our hatred of the past, out of which our world had emerged. Our capitalist, uh, so-called capitalist modern world had emerged. Now with everything I just told you, with everything I had just told you, that there's two aspects that the, the, this thing Lenin was discovering, it wasn't just because of feudalism. Even after feudalism's gone, this dialectic remains. And it remains today precisely in the form of the small holding subject of the uh, Canadian and American state who was given a security, a compound form of property as the basis of selling labor, right? What? is the great reset what is the fourth industrial revolution and this is what i'm going to set about to explain now this is where the trucker this is where this whole convoy comes from this whole controversy comes from this there is a revolution in the forces of production upon us
There is. It's a revolution of the forces of production in which people are going to lose their means of livelihood. They're going to be separated from their means of production. And they're going to be proletarianized as all revolutions in the forces of production have had it. But our sick, slimy ruling class has learned its lesson from the New Deal. And they said, after that New Deal, we gave the people way too much power. They had too much of leverage. They had too much of a voice. How do we maximize our power amidst this fourth industrial revolution and absolutely crush and make sure the people will be at our mercy? How do we avoid, for example, they're materialists. They say, during the 1929 revolution in the forces of production people became unemployed there was social instability how do we curb social instability how do we make sure people have enough to survive and take care of that while being able to survive this revolution in the forces of production to secure our profits because last time we had to give the people something we had to give them a piece of the pie we don't want to have to do that again because we can't afford to because if we do that it's game over for us the ruling class we're going to be replaced by better capitalists i mean that's kind of what elon musk represents to most people isn't it he represents a new type of capitalist that's going to replace the old one. So they're scared of this. They're scared of this. So they devised, and this is their plan that they got at Davos, and it's, it's what they're thinking about, is this great reset where, in contrast to the crash of 1929, it's not going to be chaos. People are not going to be, like, unemployed and there's going to be social unrest because, A, they're going to fuel funding for police they're going to militarize the police. They're going to increase surveillance. They're going to have, they're going to use this data economy to monitor us in every possible fucking way. So all that social unrest that they had to fear in the 1930s, that's taken care of just by pure force, right? The might of force. I haven't even explained the data economy and, and its significance. And it's not just a tool of control. It's more, it's uh, economic analysis, right? Yeah, they're going to use uh, uh, January 6th as their predecessor to even clamp down more on our civil liberties. Then they are going to give us something. We're just not going to own any of it. The people are not going to have any say in it. We're going to have a pod. We're going to eat bugs. We're going to have, we're going to own nothing at all. And we're going to work for these corporations. And these corporations are going to have total control over us. If we don't do what they say, we get fired. And maybe if we get fired, we'll get a universal basic income. And we'll just sit in our pods and survive. We'll become like the people in the fucking matrix. That is what they have planned for us. That is what the ruling class, which did survive. Our ruling class did survive 1929. They survived the last last capitalist crisis they survived 73 they survived that capitalist crisis so they, they're like a cockroach they've survived too long and this is their final plan to make it out of the fourth industrial revolution pacify the population completely subordinate them tear away any of their means of resistance and ensure their survivability while making sure they have no security and no leverage themselves so they have to fully trust us. They don't have to earn our trust by us giving them something so they have the minimum of independence. We're going to fully subordinate them to us. They're going to be fully dependent on us. This is their plan. This is their plan. This has been their plan. They have waged the war against small businesses precisely because of this. Because they don't control the small businesses. You think it's about the petite bourgeoisie or something like that. The petite bourgeoisie in the class has been outmoded. What is a petite bourgeoisie? There is a big monopoly bourgeoisie. And there are those who have a compound form of labor. There's no independent petite bourgeoisie in this day of age. Now, some of these small business owners become rich. But the ones that do become rich, they always hit a ceiling. And that ceiling is the establishment. I mean, why do you think Elon Musk is against the status quo? Because even he hit a ceiling. He knows that he's never going to have the influence and the power that all these inf insiders are who are in bed with the government. Elon Musk isn't part of their club. He's the outsider. Donald Trump got kicked out of their club. And that's why he did what he did, right? Yeah, the, the today's petite bourgeoisie are professional managerials, right? So you got to understand this. That's what they have planned, okay? Now, they're going to keep this machine. They're going to keep their profits churning at our expense. They're going to maintain their power at our expense. And it's not just their power. It's the power of our establishment. The entrenched politicians, our fucking mainstream media, our corporations, they all don't want to let go. Our fourth industrial revolution would completely outmode them. Shouldn't the internet have fucking blown CNN out of the water? It didn't. They survive like cockroaches. And they want to continue to survive. And that's why they're doing this great reset shit. Because in order to survive, 
they have to put the people down. In order to survive, they have to put us in pods, just like in the Matrix. We have to be their battery. Because the way it works now is that there is a revolution in the forces of production at hand. The old way can't keep going. It cannot continue as before. That's true. That's where we draw a line and disagree with the reactionaries. We have to tell the reactionaries and the working class, listen, the old way cannot continue. That much is correct. But where communists are going to must step in is this is what we will tell them. As all previous revolutions in the forces of production, you need some land. We are going to fight for you to take some land. Because yes, your old way of life can't adjust to this new economy. But you're still a human being. You're still a man. You still have dignity. So as communists, the whole point of communism, that's why it's associated with equality and all that shit. The whole point of communism is because we want people to be able to survive this great reset, this fourth industrial revolution, and have something. Have something that will maintain some independence, allow you to be a dignified human being, not be dependent on all these corporations and this government, and actually make it yourself let the people breathe that's what china did that's what russia did they gave the people something so the people could be themselves so they could flourish and they could thrive we're not committed to helping this establishment and this fucking parasitical ruling class you should flourish you should have wealth you should thrive may the best man win right the most talented the most skilled the best artists the best um even the best entrepreneurs whatever let's 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 actually have a people's great reset where the monopolies in the ruling class don't have the power they do anymore and everyone starts on a fresh basis equal opportunity that's what communism means the reason it needs to be communism is because communists critique the existing forms of private property which means communists are able to circumvent the special privileges the ruling class has in the name of the sacred right of private property and use it to the advantage of the people. Give the people something. Allow the people to own something. And it's not just one thing, it's a relationship, right? The government needs to have a relationship with the people, but it has to build trust. In order to build trust, you have to give the people something so they're not fully dependent on you. So they're not fully a slave to you and fully at your mercy, right? And from there, yes, there's probably gonna have to be new regulations and new ways we maneuver that and get around that, but we'll focus on that in the future. For now, the people, we need to earn their, I mean, we communists need to earn their trust. The government, a new government, a people's government has to earn their trust. I mean, that's how China works. That's the that's the bread and butter of the Chinese system. It's not full government unconditional control. It's a social contract between the people and the government. The government makes sure people have a minimum of independent livelihood, like land or a plot, uh, um, a single unit apartment that they own, so that the people can have a fresh base with which to flourish, and the monopolies don't get to implement satanic, evil agendas like the Great Reset, where they put us in fucking pods and fully suck our life force dry and enslave us. Okay, so it's important to rethink what communism is. Communism is about changing the economy only because things like this happen. Capitalism does give rise to monopolies and changes in the forces of production. And you do need communism to be able to navigate those waters. Because if we're just free market laissez-faire capitalists, one, we're not going to address to the special needs of the new economy in any kind of way. Two, we're not going to be able to challenge the power of the monopolists and people who, who are implementing the Great Reset. Because they're just going to say, this is our free market. In order to have a real free market, we need a communist intervention in this economy to break their power. That's the case for communism I make to people like the truckers and to the working class. And so far, they have an ear. Even the people not fully convinced change their view about what communism is. And to me, that's more of an accomplishment than anything else, right? At least, I mean, you're not going to convince people immediately, but at least you're going to give them something to think about, right? And that's the bare minimum of what we need right now, okay? That's the bare minimum of what we need right now, okay? Now, let me tell you finally what the vaccine mandates represent to these truckers and why they're resisting the vaccine mandates. It's not because they're brainwashed or they're irresponsible or or they're evil, or they're stupid, or whatever the fuck these people are trying to say, these leftists. It's for a very simple reason. The vaccine mandates represent a new type of socialization and regulation of the economy by the government in tandem with the fourth industrial revolution. I'll explain the connection soon, don't worry about that. Without the securities. So imagine after the, you know, after the New Deal, how powerful the federal government got? It got very powerful. Why did the people tolerate that? Because the people also had something that they could rely on and be independent in regards. So the people tolerated all these new regulations. Yeah, the government 
you can regulate our roads, you can regulate all this shit because we get it, right? We're all interdependent. We need a way to like work together. We need this to work. We, we you know, we all need the same highway to get to work and back and, and go where we're going. So yeah, we need all these regulations to, to live, right? The fourth industrial revolution is also demanding a lot of new regulations, right? But the people are being regulated like these vaccine mandates without being given any interest, without being given any piece of the pie of the new fourth industrial revolution. So it's like they, it's almost as if, imagine if all those New Deal regulations happened without people being able to have cars in the first place and people being able to have homes in the first place. They're just imposing all this tyranny on us and we have no say in it and no part in it. What's in it for them? Nothing. Now people are saying, well, it's because of the pandemic. Give me a fucking break. There's been pandemics in human history before. It's not just because of COVID. It's clearly a stand-in. I mean, this fourth industrial revolution was going to fucking happen with or without COVID. It's just that COVID, coincidentally, seemed to have accelerated it at the right place in the right time. Now, why do the vaccine mandates represent um, the new data economy and the fourth industrial revolution? I'll tell you why. Because I'll explain it like this. The internet, social media, the so-called metaverse, right, has fundamentally encompassed the whole of our lives, total whole of our lives. Yet the framework with which um, this has happened has still been on the basis of the voluntary liberties and rights bestowed to us by the democratic state. So, for example, I can opt out of this shit, you know, um, it's fundamentally transformed our lives. I still have the liberty to throw this phone in a lake and go live in the woods or something and, and, and opt out. Right. I don't have to. Be a part of it. I still have my rights and my liberties, right? This is just a thing, a layer on top of that. That's all it is. It's just a layer on top. Yeah, Cuba has no vaccine mandates, but a very high vaccination rate because of a specific relation between the state and its people. Exactly, right? Um, I don't have to be a part of this, right? So I want you to think of it like in Death Stranding, that game, the the chiral. You know, there's this, un there's a, there's... There's the, in Death Stranding, basically, there's this invisible realm. It's called the chiral, it's called chirality. So everything in Death Stranding, like, you turn on a certain, you have a certain equipment that allows you to see it, but, like, there's these, like, ghosts, these, like, these black dust particles or some shit that represent, like, this invisible force here, right, Bet between all of us. Well, that invisible force is the metaverse. It's the internet. It's the social media, right? So it's here, right? But the government has not caught up to the revolution in the forces of production. The base has changed. The superstructure has not yet adjusted to it. And one of the ways the superstructure is adjusting to it is by instituting all-encompassing forms of regulation and control that are inescapable, just like social media is inescapable. It's just not formally so, right? So vaccine mandates basically represent this for people. Vaccine mandates represent the government being able to exercise total regulation and control. The question is on what basis? So for example, what the truckers are saying is I'm in my fucking truck. Oftentimes I own this truck and I'm going to talk about that ownership thing in a second. And the government's coming and telling me I have to take a fucking vaccine. Why? I earned this truck. I had to work for it. I work my fucking job. What right do you have to tell me I need to take a fucking vaccine? Who are you? You're not in my business. You're not in my industry. Well, it's clear. The vaccine mandate represents a forced form of socialization. It's forcing these truckers to be a part of a sociality they don't want to be well it's not just that they don't want to be but it's forcing them to be a part of a sociality without giving them the basis for which that sociality benefits them economically so it's like they're being there it's a forced form of socialization they'll say oh you have to take the van vaccine mandates for the benefit of us all who the fuck is us all right i'm a trucker driving my fucking truck making a living i'm not you know what i mean i'm not part of you i make my bread this way i don't make bread with you we don't make bread in a social way i have to sit in my fucking truck and make it myself you're gonna force this fucking mandate on me right so the government's sticking its nose somewhere without paying for it you understand it's sticking its nose somewhere without paying for it the way the government could pay for that potentially is um give the truckers something right or uh um, prepare them for this new fourth industrial revolution and have a new relationship between the government and the people they might be more inclined to take that vaccine they might be more inclined to feel like they're part of this bigger social community where we have to have public health and care about our common health and, and whatever right so that's how you would do it. That's how communist states have done it, right? Because they have the trust of the people, right?
When many people don't want their products handled by non-vax truckers, then don't pay for non-vax truckers. It's just fucking stupid. Like, you're a trucker. You never signed up for this metaverse shit where we're all part of this virtual world where you can impose these these mandates and shit. So you have to understand, the mandates are a stand-in for socialization. And that socialization specifically corresponds to the fourth industrial revolution. So it's almost a form of false consciousness. They're rejecting the mandates because the mandates represent the fourth industrial revolution. It represents the government increasingly adjusting itself to this fourth industrial revolution without having any mandate from the people. The government is devoid of a mandate from the people. You need a mandate from the people in order to fundamentally transform and embark upon this new socialization and, and control. They don't have a mandate from the people, and yet they're trying to force a vaccine mandate upon the people. So this is very important to keep in mind. You understand now what this is about? It's much more than just vaccine mandates. And, and by the way, vaccine mandates, lockdowns, 5G are all part of the same fucking thing. Thank you, Noble Wuma. Appreciate you. Thank you for the 550 subs. A lot of leftists losing around. Why are people against 5G? Why are people against vaccines? Because you don't have a class analysis. These are all part of literally the same thing. It is about a forced form of socialization where you have to opt in to this new metaverse and this new increasing level of socialization. And you know, I have to preface the words I'm using because they may not be entirely clear to everyone. Increased levels of socialization correspond to government's ability to institute regulations and policies that affect people more directly, more proximately, and more uh, in terms of scale in a more widespread fashion. The government has like more power to regulate aspects of our lives when our lives become so closely intertwined to an extent that we're socialized, right? So this specific form of intertwinement of our lives, during, I mean, you could say, oh, there's always been viruses and this would apply to any other moment in history. And it just wouldn't, right? Because again, this change was happening before coronavirus. Coronavirus has merely accelerated it. And it's a form of opting us in to this data economy, to this new metaverse, whatever the fuck you want to call it, right? Do I think 5G is supposed to? I don't know anything about 5G. All I would say is that the reasons people oppose it are not actually because of the health concerns. That's what they say. But look at the class. Look, Have a materialist analysis of things, right? Okay. Now, it's like that's very important, right? Now, um, what you have to understand when it comes to that vaccine mandate is there's a lot of ways that it's related to the fourth industrial revolution and the data economy. The first way is that it's a form of data. A vaccine mandate forces you to have proof of vaccination. And soon that becomes a registry of like, can you enter this business? Prove that you're vaccinated. Now the pandemic may end and the proof of vaccination may disappear. But the more fundamental way of this kind of state inscription of are you excluded or are you included is going to remain. This more fundamental way of regulating people's status in order for them to participate in the economy is going to be applied to other things too, not just their status as it pertains to the virus and vaccination. That's part of the metaverse and the data economy and the fourth industrial revolution, right? It's all part of that. Smart cities are going to increasingly regulate people's behavior, people's um, statuses through surveillance. Uh, in order to better optimize businesses to address people's wants, to address people's needs, and to know what kind of people they're dealing with in the first place. Oh, you're a criminal? You can't enter this bar. Oh, your face reflects a, a, um, a, a heightened mood of anger and aggressiveness? You're not going to be... Like, these small things optimize and make businesses and make the process of extracting money from consumers more efficient right? I have detected a change in your mood. I mean, that's what the data economy is about. The data economy is using AI uh, in order to optimize the forces of production around what consumers demand, right? Oh, your mood is sad. Would, can I, may I, Alexa, I will recommend you uh, a fucking fleshlight. I don't fucking know, right? It, that's, that's what it's about, right? So the vaccine mandates are a way to like make that real, not just from your smartphone, but just when it comes to business, it's forms of codification and inscription of the population in general, right? We've never had that before. Like when have we ever had this thing where it's like, oh yeah, in order to enter the Walmart, you're going to have to have...
a proof Void that proves you're included and excluded. Let me tell you some other scary implications that vaccine mandates are setting us up for. So we used to just be citizens where we could just breathe as citizens. I'm a citizen, you're a citizen. I can walk with my nuts hanging and go to Walmart. The rights, the democratic rights entailed to us by citizenship are going to be stripped away. Soon, <clears throat> we're going to have other forms of regulations. Like, for example, can you enter this Walmart? What is your workplace status? How many funds do you have? What is your standing with uh, the court? I mean, that's why people raise the fuss about China's social credit system because that's what they see it as. It's like you have a social credit system and it's going to determine what your freedom of movement and your freedom of purchase. But what people don't understand is that China's social credit system is, is a grassroots thing and it specifically applies businesses and not individuals. It doesn't, you know, and it's specifically about promoting good behavior, right? Like don't litter and don't be a slob and shit. It's not meant to enforce political loyalty or political correctness. But it is going to become like that in the West and in America and in Canada, right? Um, so we're going to actually have, you know, the thing that they're saying, the social credit system in China, it's not actually how it works in China, but we are going to get that here in the way that they're just like the, sh the boogeyman of the social credit system. We're getting that here. Right? They don't have that in China, but we're getting the thing we accuse China of having. We're getting that here. It's going to go way beyond credit scores. I mean, think about what this new culture of vaccine mandates opens up. It's a slippery slope. Oh, we accept vaccine mandates now. Why don't we accept other forms of identification and, and um, proof of uh, submission to the state and to corporations and to Silicon Valley? It's going to be other forms of proof of loyalty. So this is a very important... Now, I, I was talking about the Lysenko shit a few days ago and stuff because I was specifically addressing the justifications for vaccine mandates, which is trust in the science and the establishment. And I proved to you the science is shit. It's a idol. It's a uh, it's a Baphomet. It's a fucking Moloch. It's a it's an idol, right? It's not the reason. But I didn't do that just to shit on science. I did it to so we can get to the actual cause of the controversy. It's not about science. It's not about this. It's not about that. It's about a material revolution in the forces of production. And Marxists are best equipped to understand this type of thing. And it's what Marxists should be doing. But instead, we have dumbasses like Q who are spending their time getting whipped up in the partisan frenzy of, of taking sides and being like, oh, well, I'm against the truckers because they're bad and evil. And you're just a fucking liberal, dude. You're not a fucking Marxist. A Marxist takes a cold distance analysis and then they decide, how am I going to relate to it? I take my cold analysis and then I say, I'm with the fucking truckers. According to the immortal science of Marxism-Leninism, I am with those truckers. Now, some may say something like, Haas, aren't the truckers reactionary for trying to resist a revolution in the forces of production? No, they're not. They're not reactionaries because that resistance isn't about impeding a revolution in the forces of production. It's not even necessarily about vaccines. It represents the beating heart of the people, of humanity, and of the historical successors of the proletariat, the working class fighting for their humanity, fighting for their existence as human beings, fighting for their rights amidst an attempt by the ruling class and by the elites to secure their existence at the people's expense. This resistance is beautiful. It's poetic resistance. They had their great reset agenda and all this shit. And from the soil of the people, those people in their trucks came out and resisted it because they own the trucks. They have the trucks. The, and this is, this is why it's so poetic, beautiful, and communist. They have the real solid thing. You, elites, you have your metaverse. You have your digital bullshit and your digital control, but you forgot about the meat and potatoes means of production, now didn't you? You've forgotten the meat and potatoes, the concrete, the steel, and the metal that makes all that shit possible, now didn't you? You forgot about those big trucks that facilitate all the goods in general, and in the same goddamn fucking way, you forgot about our goddamn humanity, that we're living, breathing flesh and blood. That's what you forgot about. This ruling class... It's the meat and potatoes they forgot about, and it's the meat and potatoes that the truckers have. Now, finally, there's one last thing I want to address before getting deeper into the critique of Q and his fucking bullshit. He doesn't know shit about Marxism, doesn't know shit about anything.
I'm going to debunk it. Many of these truckers, if not most, he claimed that they're thriving and they're, they're privileged doing so well. Even if they own their trucks, how many of them are in debt? How many of them work as indentured servants paying off the debt? Because they don't even really buy the truck. They It was loaned to them and they're paying off the debt for it. You forgot how this is also about debt. They're facing extinction as a class because they can't pay off the debt, the traditional way in which peasants were separated from their means of production. That's the creme de la crop. This is an article I'm going to take some time to debunk with you all. We're going to refute the common claims. The trucker convoy is not a workers' revolt. We'll see. We'll go ahead and see about that. Oh my god. He earned his PhD in sociology from York University. A fucking useless PhD, dumbass PhD, useless fucking time-wasting dumbass. I shit on your PhD. I wipe my fucking ass with your PhD. I have given you like a dozen possible explanations for why they're resisting the mandates based on materialism. This guy is just going, I don't know. It's so, it's just one of those absurdities of life. Such as the brilliant and sweeping analysis of the controversy at hand such as the impartial, cold, materialist analysis of Adam King, that he's going to tell us that he doesn't get it. It's just, it's just a needle. That's what this all... What a fucking Philistine. What a fucking idiot. It's just a needle. It's just a needle. No, clearly it's a lot more than just a needle. Clearly it represents a lot more to these workers, right? Clearly there's way more at stake for them than just a needle. This is as fucking stupid as saying, like, that politics is just about policies, or it's like... I don't know. Um, this is just this is as fucking stupid as saying the Black Lives Matter protests were just about George Floyd. Yeah, people make a big deal of shit that seems small because those small things symbolize much bigger things than just them by themselves. Like, it's just Marxism 101, you fucking dumbass. This guy would read Shakespeare, and this is an anti-Semitic part of Shakespeare, so trigger warning, I guess. But he'd read Shakespeare, and he'd be like, Oh my god, why was Shylock making such a big deal out of that pound of flesh? It's just a pound of flesh, Shylock. Why are you making such a... Like, this is the level of Philistinism and literary analysis. For reference, in Shakespeare, Shylock was a Jewish merchant who, um... He gave out a loan to someone, and he said, Listen, motherfucker, if you don't pay back this loan... You don't have any security to give me. So if you don't pay it back, I want a fucking pound of your flesh, right? And the guy's like, oh, okay. So the guy, something happened. There was a storm that fucked up the investment. And Shylock literally had demanded, give me that fucking pound of flesh, motherfucker. And he wanted it so bad, but it's not because he wanted the pound of flesh. He wanted to make a point. He was sick of the hypocrisy of society in, you know, the way it fucking didn't make account for its debts. Like, not just financial debts, but like in general, right? <clears throat> but it's like, this is the love. This is like such a Philistine idiot dumbass. Something is innocuous. Is there I suppose these are the unfortunate times in which we live so this guy is positioning himself as like wiser than the world he's in the know he's so much smarter this is just the ridiculous times we live in guys what a sweeping mature analysis of the situation this is just a fucking npc that's all he is as an npc he doesn't have any independent thoughts he's literally just assuming that his establishment mentality, his professional managerial ideology is shared by the whole world. Why do I have 260 fucking notifications? I don't want 275 fucking notifications. Excuse me. Excuse me, I just don't. Okay, continuing. Um, the vaccine mandate required those in international trucking who crossed the United States border back into Canada to be vaccinated as of January 15th Similar vaccine mandates have rolled out for other federally regulated employees as working air realm. The Biden administration has imposed a similar mandate. CTV News has reported that those leading the Freedom Convoy claim 26,000 tr truckers may not comply with the mandate. It seems like a considerable overestimation. The Canadian Trucking Alliance says that 85% of the 120,000 truckers have already been vaccinated. Is there any interest why the Canadian Trucking Alliance would have a reason for making that up. Hmm. Let's look up the Canadian Trucking Alliance. Let's just see if we're just going to accept their statistics. What is the Canadian Trucking Alliance? What is this relationship to monopoly trucking companies and the establishment? I wonder. 
Let's do a little bit of research and follow the fucking money. So it's a federation of provincial trucking associations. Okay, that's weird. What are these provincial trucking associations? Um, cr cross town or cross country, the choice is yours. The face of trucking and career opportunities it provides are changing. Oh, how are they changing? Look at all this fucking uh, internet bullshit. Tech savvy. Oh, they want... So it kind of looks like they want fucking hipsters, techie hipsters to be the truckers. And for whatever reason, it seems like they're a little bit dissatisfied with the current demographic of truckers who are just boomers and um, not really tech savvy people. So it, it kind of looks like something's going on with... I, I don't know. It, it seems doubtful that they actually represent truckers. It seems like these are people with an agenda to bring in more truckers. Why would they have that agenda, right? There's a labor shortage of truckers. What agenda do they have to... to, to solve that problem how does that help truckers it makes it makes truckers have less economic leverage right so is this does this represent truckers or do they represent trucking companies and trucking monopolies in bed with the establishment and the government we'll have to find out cta is a federation of the country's provincial trucking associations it represents provincial carriers from all walks of life and all sectors it includes sufficient profitability and enhanced image mutually beneficial partnerships with customers safe and environmentally and social okay when you get when you start hearing about that environmental shit that's a code word by the way just want to let you know um Okay, this is really mysterious and vague, but I'm going to go ahead and deduce without being able to conduct any further uh, research that this is glowy as fuck. This is the establishment and their fucking claim probably shouldn't be trusted that all the truckers are happy and satisfied and that these this is just a minority of bad apples. Of course, they're going to say some shit like that. It's fucking ruling class propaganda and nothing more. So we can already deduce that's not a very reliable source. It's ruling class propaganda, government propaganda. The federal minister. Oh, oh, the federal minister of transportation put it at 90 percent. May as well put it at 95 since you're probably just pulling it out of your fucking ass. But even if it was true for the sake of having the devil's advocate that the majority are vaccinated, it doesn't say anything about whether they want to be vaccinated or whether or not they relate to the resistance against the vaccine mandate for the material reasons I gave you before, for the class and material reasons. It doesn't even address any of that. According to these numbers, yes, according to these numbers, somewhere between 12,000 and 18,000 truckers who regularly cross the border are currently not vaccinated. And I'm willing to bet that more or a few of them would rather get shot than lose their jobs. Get the shot than lose their jobs. Ah, we're just going to threaten you with getting fired. They will obey me if I threaten them. Why don't they get it voluntarily? Why do you have to threaten them with their jobs? What he's de this person's definitely made the successful case that there's no basis among the majority of truckers for the freedom convoy. It's just a few bad apples. We just have to pretty much like force them to get the shot at a proverbial gunpoint. But you know, we when I whip my serfs, they they just obey. So the serfs are good and obedient because when I whip them, they obey what I say. So clearly they don't have a problem. Every time I beat them with a stick, they do what I say. And I'm sure my serfs, if I beat them hard harder will do what i say so what's the problem why are these serfs rebelling who's this who's this guy thomas moonser thomas moonser the peasant rebellion he's a complete psychopath also he's being backed by florian Ge uh, florian geyer and the um the black army of uh knights and those are privileged knights okay florian geyer came from a privileged knight background he does not represent the peasants okay he's the only knight that defended the peasants but you know that song? Yeah, that's propaganda because you know this this um uh the black band of Florian Geyer. Uh yeah, that that was those were not peasants, those were knights. Okay, so clearly they don't represent the peasants. Okay, most of the serfs, I beat them with a stick and they listen to what I say. So be like a good obedient serf, be like a good peasant and listen, okay? Because when I beat them with a stick, they do what I say. When I threaten them with their jobs being lost, they'll be more than happy to comply. It's just these rabble rousers causing disarray ah oh, my phd candidate i'm a phd i have a phd it makes my nipples hard ah i'm thinking about all the power i'm gonna have in this new great reset they're gonna have to all listen to me and i'm gonna be able to control all these vulnerable people and my agenda will be implemented ah with no pushback beat them with a stick so far
The liberals claim there's been no noticeable reduction in trucks. Ultimately, the number of truckers who prize their freedom... <laughs> freedom... Freedom... <laughs> there's some freedom for you. You... Just haven't had a good old taste of the whip. Yeah, once you get a taste of that whip, keep talking to me about your freedom. These peasants and serfs going on about their freedom. Oh, excuse me. Freedom? <laughs> Next, they're going to start talking about having rights. <laughs> no, no, this is the best one. This is the best one. Next, they're going to start talking about having liberties. <laughs> Oh, my God. what's next? What's next? We're going to let these peasants vote? <laughs> oh, man, it's just out of the ballpark. Freedom? Really? Freedom? I mean, what's next? What's next? Uh, independence? Like, emancipation? Oh, okay, yeah, let's just emancipate the serfs, guys. <laughs> let's just, let's just emancipate the serfs. I mean, these, these peasants and their wild delusions, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's absolute madness, you know? Anyway, oh, to get others sick over maintaining their livelihood is likely to fall well short of their projections by the political hucksters orchestrating this modern so-called Woodstock of the petite bourgeoisie. Because, you know, listen, the petite bourgeoisie, those are the citizens. Those are the working class. I hate them. You want to know why? Because they're a little bit independent from me. Meanwhile, these vulnerable migrants and marginalized groups, ooh, they're so desperate, it's so easy to control them. <laughs> oh, you better listen to me or else you're getting deported. You don't have rights, you're not a citizen, you're grateful to be here so I can control you. The petite bourgeoisie, you know, the people who have the minimum of independence, who have leverage, the, petite, the people I have to convince, who aren't going to rely on me based on pure social desperation, who I can't immediately institutionalize to realize my agenda, the people I've had a hard time convincing to be class conscious after the 70s. I read Chairman Mao's works. I read the works of Chairman Mao and the quotations of Chairman Mao. And when I went to that construction site, they all spit in my face. So I hate them. But when I talk, to a crackhead on the street, he was pretty open to it. Mm. So, I think I know who the real proletariat is now. Haha. <laughs> I know who the real proletariat is now. Anyway, let's continue. The extent to which this convoy is actually about trucking or truckers is debatable. The network of far-right, wealthy organizers and donors back in... Yeah, Florian Geyer? Yeah, he was a knight. You think Thomas Munzer represents the peasants? Why are all the knights backing him? Okay. Calls claims of authentic connection to working class truckers into question. The convoy's two principal organizers are no figures of Canada's far right. The Canada Anti-Hate Network draws a range of further connections between the convoy and far right racist and xenophobic elements. Oh, I really believe you. Let's see. These are the two principal organizers. What is the evidence of these being the two principal organizers? Is there any evidence of that? Okay. A key party fi figure in the Maverick Party is leading a fundraising effort. So that means he's the leader of the convoy? No. If the far right are the first ones to organize fundraising, that doesn't mean they're responsible for the fucking convoy itself, you dumbass. You should have been there faster to fucking organize that fundraising than they were. They got there first. You snooze, you lose, you dumbass. You were out here denouncing. Even before they started fundraising for anything, you were denouncing these fucking truckers. Don't fuck can sit here and tell me your excuse for hating them is because of the far-right organizers when even before these people started fundraising anything you came out against them you fucking liar and dumbass the toronto star reported last week that go fund me i hate when people can raise money without institutions controlling it through which the convoy organized raising money was freezing 4.7 million ah ta-da until it verified where the funds had come from and on what they'd be spent. And you know why? Because it's just a rational thing. There's no ruling class agenda. There's no class bait. There's no class war. It's just the rational versus the irrational. And I'm a Marxist. And this conflict is between the irrational mob and the rational sane. You know, it reminds me of this movie I watched, Marie Antoinette. I don't know what, like, what the French Revolution was or what Marx had to say about it. 
but I'm pretty sure he would have been on the side of the rational nobles and would have totally denounced those irrational mob rebel rousers who were just, how dare they? Marie Antoinette and, and her friends were rational. And, you know, I, I'm pretty sure Marxism is about being on the side of rational people and not crazy rabble rousers, okay? Convoy organizers claim the funds are used for fuel, feud, and loading truckers. When the convoy came to Kingston, Kingston police counted 17 full tractor trailers 104 tractors with no trailers 424 passenger vehicles six rvs that's some expensive gas in hotels no it's not you know how much that shit costs do you know how much this shit costs are you stupid are you a fucking trucker yourself you don't know how much it fucking costs at least one third of the 2.8 million came from anonymous donors. Oh, like the anonymous donors that funded the Bolsheviks sometimes? Yeah, that happens. You know there's anonymous donors who fund me? They're called oil princes. Sometimes they come in and give me 100 subs. Does that, you know what I mean? That's how it works, you fucking idiot. Just because someone has money doesn't mean they're aligned with the ruling class. People who have money can have all sorts of ideologies and views and causes they want to support. You're an idiot. Or those using fake names. In some cases, donations as large as 25,000 were made anonymously or using aliases. The latter, a violation of GoFundMe's terms of service. You violated the terms of service, now didn't you? Mm -mm -mm. And by the way, I'm the one who reported that. As of January 23rd, 31st, the convoy had raised more than 9.4 million. What? You mean they had mass support from the people? And you mean people rich and poor and in the middle were all donating to them? What? No, no. It's all Nazis. The CTA, which represents the real truckers and not the establishment, and that totally believe me, trust me, with Al Gabra, Seamus O'Regan, the federal minister of labor, and Carla Qualtro, the minister of employment, distancing itself from the so-called freedom convoy. Oh my God. Hold on, wait. All right, guys, I was wrong. Everything I said was just, this whole stream was wrong. Because it turns out the government distanced itself from the Freedom Convoy and the government shill CTA. I can't believe the government distanced themselves from the convoy. I can't believe it. I can't believe I I give up. I, I lost. It's I, You know, I might as well leave. Why am I still here? Why am I even still here? Okay, I didn't know the government denounced them. I shouldn't even, I'm, this is embarrassing. I gotta go, guys. Sorry. Bye. Hey, hold on, hold on. I did just think of something, and I just want to double check. Um, why wouldn't the fucking government distance itself from an anti-government protest movement. Just curious. Before I go, can you please tell me that? Because I'm willing to go. This is such a profound, beautiful point. But can you please explain to me why the government wouldn't denounce them? Who knows? The reason elides us. The reason elides us. Still. We may never know. Who knows? I mean, I don't know. Do you know? We may never know. It's complete mystery. Okay? Let's continue. Yeah, there's no way to tell, honestly. The joint statement reads, in part, Since the outset of the pandemic, the government of Canada, Canadian trucking, I don't give a fuck. The CTA, as the largest trucker employer association, has... <laughs> Are you going to tell us about what the CTA actually is? Or are you going to fucking lie? What does this mean? What does a large trucker employer association mean? Because it sounds like a government thing to me. It sounds like something in bed with the government and the companies and the establishment. To me, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like the monopoly trucker companies are this. Wait, hold on. Wait, I didn't even see that. Hold on. I... I actually didn't see this. <laughs> it's not even an employee association. It's an employer association. These are literally the bosses. It's a fucking association of the bourgeoisie. I literally didn't. I, 
I didn't. I, 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 it's so like unfathomable. I assume this was employee in my head. I just caught it. This is an employer association. The CTA is an employer association, which means it's the fucking bosses. You fucking idiot. Oh my God. The rule. <laughs> <laughs> the managers, <laughs> the employers are against it. What is, what is this? Hold on. <laughs> Adam D. King. He's a union researcher. I bet. I don't know what kind of research he's doing, but he's citing the authority of an employer association. <laughs> Guys, think of the employers. Think of the bosses, the employers. Yeah, he researches grad student unions. What? What am I? Okay, hold on. You know what? This this is so beautiful. You know, uh, for all their posturing, they're always gonna go back to sucking the cock of the ruling class. That's what these people do. This he's he's like effortlessly citing the CTA like a legitimate, respectable authority. That's the employer association, though. That's the employer association. What? You're just gonna you're just gonna like you're just gonna like agree with them and be like, okay, yeah, they're right. You're just gonna side with the bosses, basically. It called on protesters to remain peaceful and sought to disavow any connection to far-right elements. <coughs> the Association of Provincial Trucker Employer Groups had previously argued against the vaccine mandate, resuming it knowing that a vocal minority of its small business membership opposed the policy. On the other hand, as the business represented for the industry that is most engaged with the federal government, it understands and wants to maintain its access to those with influence and power. I, the, he wrote this, not me. He literally just said, the CTA is in bed with the federal government it represents the industry and wants to remain, it wants access to those with influence and power. So what does that say about the statistics they gave here, distancing themselves and saying 85, well, all this shit. Literally, shut the fuck up. Spoke in the industry, complain of a labor shortage, conservative MPs are not parroting the line. <clears throat> Steve, the narrative of a perpetual struggle shortage serves those with real power in the industry. The myth of a constant labor shortage allows... But there is a labor shortage because of the pandemic, you fucking dumbass. If there's like a tendency for them to exaggerate labor shortages, whatever. But right now, I'm pretty sure that's not what this is. I'm pretty sure there's actually a real fucking labor shortage. What a brain-dead, stupid fucking article to write. The myth of a constant labor shortage allows trucking firms to lobby governments for looser regulations concerning labor rights, worker training, and safety. Okay, but there actually is a labor shortage right now. There is one right now. And actually, the labor shortage helps truckers because it increases demand, which means they get paid more as long as, you know, <coughs> they're not the fucking monopoly industries who are hiring people. The labor shortage is entirely superficial. I'm looking for a citation, and he's talking about the 1980s. In the, pan in the aftermath of the pandemic, is there a labor shortage? Where's the citation for this that it's entirely superficial? You may claim that the long term it was entirely superficial, but how about now? Deregulated to break the power of organized labor and increase competition through a proliferation of small non-union firms. Once free trade agreements with the U.S. came into force, Canadian trucking was overhauled in the same way. Populated by many competing for higher trucking firms, a proportion of which are operated by relatively wealthy small business owners. Well, what proportion? What proportion? You know, you see this vague language? He does, he's saying a proportion because he doesn't want to tell you that it's actually a minority. The majority are not wealthy. It's a minority who are wealthy. The result for most trucking workers has been disastrous. Working conditions of pay become so degraded for the majority that turnover is at record highs. Workers are under countenance and terrible conditions for so long. It's almost like the trucker convoy is the boiling point of all that. Just like Trump's was for NAFTA. NAFTA lasted decades. It only came to the fore with Trump. This leads to a situation where there's actually a surplus of trained and licensed drivers, but growing numbers of them driven out of the industry by its horrendous conditions. <coughs> Here's the race stuff. They're dependent on a steady influx of temporary foreign workers whose vulnerable citizenship status leads them ripe for exploitation, which is true. But that also means they don't have enough leverage to be able to revolt. Uday Rana at the Globe and Mail reports that one in five truckers, Canada, South Asian... Okay, yeah, they, they go through a shitty time. Okay, employee misclassification is rampant in the trucking industry. Small trucking firms frequently force the drivers into independent contract relationships. This is the key. I talked to you about this. Downloading financial risk and expenses onto workers. Yeah, I talked to you about this. A lot of these people listed as um, operator owners are forced to do so 
They're listed on their LLCs by their companies so they can be less regulated. Misclassification further relieves small employers of making contributions to the employment insurance. The trucking sector accounts for 80% of the labor standards violations. Our research further discovered that small businesses with fewer than 100 employees accounted for 89% of labor standards violations. That's not surprising because the bigger ones are in bed with the government. The smaller firms employ only 13% of workers in the federal jurisdiction. Wait, are you saying the overwhelming majority of workers in the trucking industry are either employed by giant monopoly truckers, trucker companies who are not present at the protests or are not employed at all and are, are um, small business owners who own their so-called small business owners who own their own trucks? Because if that's the case, that really damages your argument that all the people at the protests are just kulaks who hire others labor because only 13 percent of workers are would be hired by those people far away most likely to break the law and systematically violate workers rights is small trucking firms okay no you're wrong because you're lumping in people who own trucks and only own one truck who are probably in debt with this tiny minority of people who have fleets that they own you fucking dumbass. How do you even, if you own a fleet of trucks, how are you even going to attend the protest? You're going to force your employees to attend? How are you going to bring all your trucks? You can only bring one truck, dumbass. Or you can ally with people. You know what I mean? It's just so fucking stupid what this guy's saying. It's so brain dead. You're going to hire your employees to drive your truck to the protest? Shut the fuck up. Yeah, don't lump a guy with a truck who's pretty much the same as an Uber driver with someone who has... 100 employees or less i mean what a fucking broad range of people that encompasses this is such a stupid fucking article i can't believe that q guy linked it like he was saying something have you ever seen someone get more thoroughly eviscerated than q tonight i would really feel bad i would rather not be that guy at all what a fucking joke that's a fucking joke he linked this shit as if he was making a point this is the most stupid fucking thing i've ever read interviewing many federal government inspectors confirms this okay the vast majority of their time chasing around mom and pop trucking companies okay how many of these companies are self-employed truck owners in debt versus people who hired who are a small trucker company that you know owns a fleet of 25 trucks like if you own a fleet of 25 trucks he's including you with someone who just owns their own truck this is the most stupid fucking methodology wait <laughs> It's almost over? Hold on. I was waiting for the part where he proves his thesis. He has to prove his thesis that the trucker convoy is not a workers' revolt. That's what you have to prove here, you fucking idiot. You didn't even prove it. We're getting to the end of this shit. I didn't get any statistics. I didn't get any data. I didn't even get any claims made. So let's see what he says. It's safe to assume that the people who made the trek to Ottawa aren't the same people filling labor violations claims with the federal labor program. Why? Why is it safe to us? One, why is it safe to assume that? And two, even if they weren't, that would mean that they're independent operators who don't hire anyone but just own their own trucks. Rather than exploited workers in a deregulated industry, hold on, you fucking weasel. You fucking weasel piece of shit. You didn't guess the trucker con. You said it is not a workers revolt. That was not a guess. It was an assertion. It was a statement. It was a fucking statement, actually. It wasn't a guess. It was a statement. You made the statement in your title. And then at the tail end of your fucking article, instead of justifying what your title was, you just said, my guess. Well, your guess is based on what? That truckers actually present out were, by and large, self-employed owner-operators. The small contingent of wealthier small proprietors who have made quite well in the Wild West out prior trucking. Again, this is a wrong and brain-dead statement because you're lumping in the small... Per you're making two mistakes. You're lumping them in with the small companies that hire other labor and and own you know multiple trucks you're lumping people who are just self-employed with them two you're not taking into account that many of these 
small proprietors are probably in debt and are probably facing financial hardships and are at risk for losing their trucks. You're not taking any of that into account. It was a revolt of the petite bourgeoisie, financially backed by wealthy right-wing grifters. But you haven't even proved that. You're just guessing. So why did you assert that this is not a workers' revolt? The most you could say is that you don't know, right? The most you could say here is that I don't know, right? But that's not what you're saying. You're you're making the claim that it's a revolt of the petite bourgeoisie because you guessed it to be so. Now I'll have some good faith um engagement with your thesis. I think it's not unfair to infer that the people who are able to risk and go to this convoy, this thing, probably there's probably a very significant portion, if not majority, I don't know, who own their own trucks. Because they can't get fired that way, right? They're not going to get fired. So that's not unreasonable to infer. What is unreasonable to infer is that there's a significant portion who own multiple trucks. Because you're making a very fatal fucking error of confusing. By the way, that wouldn't be the petite bourgeoisie. It would be the big bourgeoisie. If you own 25 trucks, you are a bourgeois. And you hire labor. You're, you're bourgeois. You're not a fucking petite bourgeois. Why? Because you're a small company relative to a monopoly with a thousand trucks. Get the fuck out of here. 25 trucks is a lot. 25 people. I think you guys need to understand. If you hire like five people, that's five trucks. If you hire 10 people, that's 10 trucks. If you hire 15 people, that's 15 trucks. If you have 15 fucking trucks, you're not part of the petite bourgeoisie. If you own two trucks... You're probably not part of the petite bourgeoisie. If you own one truck, maybe I'll entertain the mistake you're making and I'll forgive your mistake, but even then it wouldn't be true, right? The petite bourgeoisie is the professional managerial class today. It doesn't really exist in any other form. This weekend's idiotic pageantry was thus a political consequence of the decades-long class project to remake the trucking sector, uh, replaced with poorly regulated labor market of hyper-competition among small owner operators and other precariously poisoned workers. But I thought these people were wealthy bourgeoisie and not people either forced to list themselves as small operators as a form of misclassification or people who just are probably in debt or even if they're not in debt only own their own trucks because you're lumping those in with people who own 45 trucks by the way he's he's actually saying that someone who owns their own truck is qualitatively the same as someone who owns 70 trucks and hires 70 people to drive those trucks that's what this guy's saying this is a, a phd in sociology mind you guys sorry the chat is kind of dead is is anyone bewildered by this that Q linked this stupid fucking article. Is anyone bewildered and just shocked that this guy made such a fucking ass of himself by going on fucking Twitter and sharing this article like it actually said something? Because here's what the article said. It has said, my guess. He said it's safe to assume. He didn't prove why. And then he said it's my guess. He didn't even reason why that is. You didn't even give a reason for why that is, you dumbass. Are you trying to say there's some comparison between the regulation of vaccine mandates and labor regulations? Is that what you're saying? You didn't even make a fucking argument here. There wasn't even an argument to be found in this stupid fucking article, right? Liberal nostrums about trusting the science of vaccines aren't enough to address the most deeper issues. Only the heavy lift of union organizing, building worker power, and re-regulating the trucking sector's labor market can help be back the power of the far right and its small business supporters. Oh, so you're a parasite and you have a PhD in union research. And as it turns out, the whole solution to the problem is if people give you power and listen to you. And unions are the panacea to this whole thing. You tried unionizing Amazon, you fucking failed. Good luck. By the way, I have no idea why this would even address the issues on display of the Freedom Convoy. Because you're making a contradictory statement. If what you're trying to say is that the causes of the Freedom Convoy are, is that people are 
precariously positioned and have all this economic anxiety, that would contradict the statement you just made that the Freedom Convoy is mostly made up of wealthier small proprietors. So how would this address the Freedom Convoy if all these people are wealthy kulaks? The only people who would benefit from this are the people who, according to you, are not at the convoy. So what, do you, what, what is even the argument you're fucking making? What is even the argument you're fucking making here? It's completely illogical and fucking brain dead and stupid right and i'm gonna make a tweet right now because i have to you know what people say on twitter i'm not gonna go on your stream you want to know why guys because on twitter they have the advantage everyone's against me on twitter but as soon as they get in my vc and they come here suddenly the whole chat you know they can't hold their own so what does that say about you you fucking pussy i can go on your turf and take on thousands of people. But you can't come here and deal with my fucking chat? You fucking pussy! Without your fucking echo chamber? You don't have any ground to fucking stand on, you fucking pussy? I go on Twitter, and I take you all on! You can't even do the minimum of taking on 400 people in my chat! 500 people, whatever. Fucking pussy! These people on Twitter, they're hiding behind each other. They hide behind the crowd. I'm the only fucking man who fights them as a man, individually. I take them all on because of what I believe. I don't fucking hide behind anyone. But they can't come on my turf because they're scared. Here, we're the majority. You can never be put in a fucking situation where you're the minority. You can never be put in a fucking situation where you're the one who has to hold your own against the majority. You fucking pussies. You can only do it when you have all the support of all these followers and likes. I will go in anyone's community and take on the head guy. I went in Vosh. I had 50 viewers I went and took on Vosh. I had 50 viewers I went and took on Destiny. All these people I went on their turf alone and I took them on. You think I fucking respect these pussies who need all this social support? This is Q, by the way. That's not a joke. This is literally him. This is actually Q. This is actually Q. I, yeah. That's actually him. And yeah, you know who this is? It's Justin Trudeau. And this guy calls himself a Marxist. He says he's a Marxist, whatever. And he's this, he's this, he's this revolutionary, right? And doesn't shit just make sense? Shit just kind of makes sense, doesn't it? It just kind of makes sense like that. I mean, you will not find me... You will never find a picture of me shaking hands with someone like this. You just won't. Oh, yeah. I want to I expose more of uh, Q's blunders. Because this actually is fucking uh, embarrassing, right? So there's two tweets I'm going to address, right? There's this one, this one, okay. So, the uh, two ones I'm going to address, and we're going to move on to covering the Jackson thing. So, this guy, such a smart guy, I told him to read the development of capitalism in Russia, because he alleged the middle peasant only came about after the revolution. That's not fucking true. It existed as early as 1899. And he, he says, oh, the wealthy peasantry took the, their place among the petite bourgeoisies. See, look at this carefully worded language. The wealthy peasantry among the petite bourgeois, among which petite bourgeois? The, the minority of them that exploited other laborers or the people who just own their own land and didn't hire any labor. That's a very important distinction. Lenin thought it was an important distinction. So this is the evidence he provided me that Lenin agrees with him, that the petite bourgeois peasantry were bad, right? Here's what Lenin said. The system of socioeconomic relations existing among the peasantry shows us the presence of all those contradictions which are inherent in every commodity economy and every order of capitalism. Competition, yada, 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 concentration of production in the hands of minority, forcing of the majority into the ranks of the proletariat, their exploitation by a minority through the medium of merchants' capital, and hiring of farm laborers. There is not a single economic phenomena among the peasantry that does not bear this contradictory form, one specifically peculiar to the capitalist system, that does not express a struggle and antagonism of interest, does not imply the advantage of some and disadvantage of others. It is the case with renting the land, the purchase of land, and with the industries. Okay. What does this have to do with what I said? 
This doesn't address what Lenin said about the small petty bourgeoisie. Is this fucking idiot trying to say that Lenin made the claim that all peasants were either proletarians or capitalists? That's not true. Lenin understood there's a lot of shit in between. He wrote about it. Holy fuck, do I have to pull it up? The development of capitalism in Russia. I guess I have to pull this shit up now. Differentiations of the peasantry. So, conclusions. Okay, so, keep in mind, uh, Q claimed that the middle peasantry does, did not exist before the revolution. Lenin wrote this in 1899. Here's where he talks about the middle peasantry. The differentiary of the peasants, which develops the latter's extreme groups at the expense of the middle peasantry. Keep in mind, Lenin was describing a phenomena, a phenomena that never fully came into fruition. But on top of this phenomena of the differentiation of the peasantry into proletarian and bourgeoisie, there was the middle peasantry. And the middle peasantry were just these, the democratic petty bourgeoisie who just owned their own land. That was the middle peasantry, okay? Who remained the majority? Mind you, they were undergoing a class struggle internal to the middle peasantry. So this guy's a fucking dumbass. He cited something that talks about the way in which the middle peasantry has its own class struggle. But nowhere does he, no, nowhere does it address that Lenin regarded the middle peasantry as a revolutionary class as a whole, taken as a whole. Now he thought the proletariat should lead the middle peasantry, obviously, but he was referring to the middle peasantry as a whole. Okay, um, and this is what he said. Peasants who worked their own land and did not exploit the laborers others were largely present before the revolution. Yes! Lenin literally talks about them here and here and here and here and here and here and here. Yes, they were. What a fucking illiterate guy. This is the guy who argued with me, who ratioed me. Look at him. 155 likes. 165. Where's how many did I get? 80. This is how fucking stupid Twitter is. I'm losing my mind. You'd think I'm wrong. Is this a sign I'm wrong that I get ratioed? How can I be correct though? I got ratioed. How am I correct? How is this guy a fucking idiot who is wrong and I'm correct? Can you explain that to me? How is he wrong yet he ratios me and i'm correct can you explain that to me i'm losing my fucking mind here this is how fucking if you want to know why twitter's fucking stupid and that what's popular on twitter isn't what's true or what's correct look no further than here this idiot doesn't even know that the kulaks emerged after the stolypin reforms not the revolution the Stolypin reforms created the kulaks. Before the revolution, the majority were middle peasantry. The development of capitalism in Russia referred to the way in which the middle peasantry were increasingly being divided. Yes, but they remained the middle peasantry all throughout, up until even collectivization. In the majority of cases, the middle peasant cannot make ends meet without resorting to loans to be re repaid by labor service. Every crop faring the middle peasant, the rural proletarian, by comparison with the middle peasantry, consumes less. So he's distinguishing the middle peasantry from the rural proletariat and the pe peasant bourgeoisie. Lenin regarded the middle peasantry as the revolutionary class, led by the proletarian element within it, which would be brought out through the industrial urban working class. So that's why he believed in the alliance of the urban workers and the rural peasants. And Lenin and Mao discovered that you don't even need to go through the urban workers. You can just have the, the peasants lead the peasants because the urban ones are actually not revolutionary. Lenin learned that the hard way. After 1917, the urban working class betrayed the revolution. They led strikes, they sabotaged shit. They proved to be a counter-revolutionary force. Did you know that? Or they either joined the army and died, or the ones that stayed, they were sabotaging shit. They were going on strikes, they were protesting the Bolsheviks and all this fucking bullshit. They were wreckers. Okay, labor service presupposes and requires the middle present, one who is not very affluent, but is also not a proletarian. So he's talking about this substrate that reproduces the conditions of labor, the middle peasant. That was Lenin's brilliance. Was this, this book is more, this is the most brilliant thing Lenin ever wrote. But this is Lenin's like magnum opus. This is why Lenin was Lenin. This is what defined him. Not the state and revolution, not what is to be done, not, not 
anything else, not even imperialism, the highest stage. Oh, that comes as a close second. This is how Lenin made a difference in the history of Marxism. This book. <clears throat> in which Lenin pointed out the wealthy peasantry took up the, that has nothing to do with the middle peasantry, though. That has nothing to do with the middle peasantry. This, this is meaningless. This can either refer to the middle peasantry, which Lenin did not view the wealthy peasantry to be in association with, or it can refer to the peasant bourgeoisie, who were synonymous with the wealthy peasantry. This is a stupid fucking word to use, because is, it, is he referring to what Lenin called the middle peasantry, or is it referring to the up-and-coming peasant bourgeoisie? We don't fucking know. We don't know. But if this is meant to refer to the, big, the peasant bourgeoisie, it's not relevant to my point. If it's meant to refer to the middle peasantry, it's fucking wrong. This does not say that. He's not saying the middle peasantry is turning into the bourgeoisie. The middle peasantry is divided. That's the fucking point. How old is this Q guy? Because I am schooling him. I am dominating and fucking destroying him beyond the threshold of recovery. It's fucking sad. It's actually fucking sad. It's so fucking sad. Okay. He came on stream uh long time ago and he he sucked up to me. He was really nice and polite and cordial. Look at this. Farmers are joining in the protests too in Canada. Wow. The whole working class is rising and the left is denouncing them as Nazis. What? What what are we what are, what is this? What are we fucking living in? The whole working class is uniting. I'm going on Jackson's Twitter. That's where I got it from. The whole left is uniting. And the left, sorry, the whole working class is uniting. It's an uprising of the Canadian people. And the left is denouncing them as Nazis. What the fuck on earth is going on? We're, aren't we communists supposed to be the ones trying to lead this? Or, 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 or reach out to these people? What is going on? Oh, where, where's the Nazi flags? You guys see any Nazi flags? I don't. Well, you, where's the Nazis? You asked for it, everybody. There they are. There they are. Where's the Nazi flags? I don't see any. Farmers feed truckers. Ball. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. This is awesome. The left is denouncing this. I, I, don't, I don't know what the fuck to say. I don't... It's... Holy fuck. Okay.